Now I'm having technical difficulties. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Need to change this to uh, that one. All right. I'm trying to get this small. There we go. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. I think you can hear me and see the screen here. All right. We can't see your screen. Cannot? No, we see your face. Wonderful as it is. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Let me see how, I thought I had done the share screen, so let me try again. Uh, where do I go more? Share screen. Okay, let's try again. How about now? Yes, okay, good. I'm still technically troglodyte. <laughs> ah, there. So welcome back once again. And here we are in the course on uh, fundamental bioethical issues in the program of the Master of Science in Bioethics at St. Thomas University. Beginning as always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O Lord, send forth your spirit, and we shall be recreated. You shall renew the face of the earth. We believe it, Lord, and we ask in a very special way at this time for peace in the Ukraine, peace in the world, peace in our hearts, that we may be agents of peace for those who surround us. This we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. So as always, I ask any questions or comments from uh, previous lectures or the program as a whole. I, I do have one question. Um, yes, in reading My Meyer's book, yes. is he a little biased against genetics? Against genetics? That's, I don't know. I never read it in that light. But uh, so why, why do you say that? Uh, do you, can you give me some he examples? Always, he always seems to be very concrete about pointing out the limitations of genetics, almost almost as making a point about uh, Darwin being greater than than genetic theories. Like it just I it think. just seems that way to me. I I might be inferring that incorrectly, but yeah. Okay, well, I'll tell you one thing that uh, is very much of Meyer is uh, <clears throat> kind of the exception, no a little bit similar to Darwin with varieties. He, Darwin preferred to speak of varieties rather than species as such, because we classify, we humans classify life around us as different species and one species is not another species and so forth. But yet there is a certain continuum there. Certainly the species don't know their species, all right? And we're naming them that way to to be able to speak about them in a practical way and catalog them because we're also kind of obsessed in classifying things and cataloging them and so forth. But there's a certain continuum. So I'm thinking out loud that what uh, Meyer is uh, trying to do is point out, yes, the limitations of genetics in the sense that mm, we still know very little about genetics uh, functionally. We know the structure has been elucidated and will look at the DNA structure in greater and greater detail down to the molecular level. However, that is kind of the standard. For example, if we look at humans, right? Uh, the 7 billion that we are, close to 8 billion now, uh, there's tremendous variety. We all have the same genome, but within that genome, there is a fair amount of variation at the genetic level, at the molecular level. And so maybe that's what he's trying to point out, that we cannot go just by the theory. For example, something that I'll talk about today in greater detail is Mendelian genetics, which is where well, it all started. Um, as I spoke last time, the characteristics, the seven characteristics that Mendel looked at 
where all are non-characteristics, but that's kind of rare. That's the exception in nature. Most, most characteristics are polygenic and polymorphic. They're not a cut and dry, either black or white, all right? There's tremendous variation in nature. And so, and that is an interaction between the genes and the environment. So it's not just, it's similar to the discussion of nature or nurture, right? Nature or nurture, well, nature meaning the genes that we inherit from our parents, nurture meaning the upbringing, including the food that we eat, that we have eaten over the years, the education that we have received, the environmental influence, uh, even the, the weather that we have experienced over the years. It's the interaction between the two that actually makes the individual as we know them, as we see them today. So maybe that's why uh, he's constantly kind of harping on that is don't, don't take genetics just at the theoretical level because it's truly the interaction. And we're just beginning to understand something about genetics as much as we know uh, functionally, even though structurally we're probably more advanced structurally, meaning that we know the, the molecular composition of the DNA molecule. Does that help a little bit? Because Darwin is all about the phenotype. You see, Darwin is looking at variations. And Darwin was not too keen, uh, didn't really um, think. So Darwin is really a population biologist. He's thinking in terms of populations, not individuals. Mendel, in order to get his, at his theory, right? And the, the genius of this inheritance factors, which are microscopic is what we call today the genes, but he was able to come up with that to explain his ratios. So Mendel is really looking at the individual because he's looking at the, the variant that has either the yellow pea or the green pea and so forth. So he's looking, he's counting individuals. But Darwin is more population. Uh, as a unit. And definitely Meyer is one of the population biologists. So he's also looking at population as a unit as a whole. Anyway, I think some of this will become more clear as we go along. Uh, I thought you were going to um, highlight the uh, Meyer's uh, kind of prejudice toward um, religion in general and the Judeo-Christian tradition in particular as being the Western tradition, because that's chapter four. And while I'm at it, uh, today's lecture, I'm gonna say way in, unless there's another comment or question. Okay, so today's lecture is on variation. And because it's natural selection acts on selection, on variation, all right? And also, uh, well, we'll look at the four forces that uh, drive evolution in the second part of the lecture. But this is basically chapter five of Meyer. So what happened to chapter four? Chapter four is a little more philosophical and theological, which is essentially Meyer's attempt to claim that uh, religion in general and the church in particular slow down the progress of science by the, uh, by the beliefs of, uh, well, on one side, the fundamentalistic uh, reading of scripture, uh, particularly Genesis, and on the other side, this whole, the naive uh, intuition of spontaneous generation, right? And also a static universe, you can take it beyond the natural world, beyond life on earth, even the planets and the universe, a static universe that everything is in order and the whole issue of the universe uh, rotating, figuratively speaking around the earth. So the earth, the, the geocentric notion of, of the universe. So chapter four is about that. And therefore, if you wanna go ahead and read it, be my guest that I don't need a summary of it. I just say that Meyer is a great scientist and empiricist, 
and population biologist, but he's definitely not a theologian or even a philosopher, uh, formally speaking. There's no actual training that I know in those areas for him, systematic training. Door is locked. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, can you open the door there for, uh, I think it's Jose trying to get in. <laughs> is that? Uh, my side of the classroom. Well, leave it, leave it open. It's a, yeah, good morning. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Let me do some trick with the lights here. Uh, 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 okay. Okay, so mm, as far as chapter four, uh, you can read it if you want to but I'm not preparing a summary because I don't think it's uh, all that accurate really. It's, um, it's also a product of his own time. You know, we're all products of our time and the standard interpretation at least at some level was um, this fundamentalistic uh, interpretation of Bible. Even among the clergy now, of course, we know that in theological circles and uh, uh, and in biblical circles, uh, fundamentalism was uh, was not the standard, okay? But those were rather exclusive circles and probably he did not have access to them or never considered uh, going there, all right? But the, we know that the, the uh, critical um, uh, revision of scripture started even in the 18th centuries, uh, precisely in continental Europe <laughs> uh, with the Protestants mostly in Germany and so forth. Okay, so again, if you have any other questions or comments, uh, feel free to jump in, all right? We're gonna move into this area of um, variation because as I was mentioning, selection acts on variation, all right? That's a little phrase uh, that we can think of, uh, selection acts on variation. So I want to um, delve a little more deeply into what we mean by, by variation in science, in nature, in biology. And then, like I mentioned, the second half is going to be the four main forces that drive evolution. Meyer already made allusion to that, a mutation, migration, a drift, and selection, even though he subdivides it into about seven categories that can be clustered into four. So within this uh, topic of variation, we're gonna look at uh, population range, polymorphisms, starting more detail about genetics, quantitative traits, and then the issue of the within evolution that will set us the five, the four or five main observations that led him to the theory of evolution. And that would segue us into uh, the, the drivers of evolution in the second part of the lecture. Uh, Please, you yep. What do we have? Yes, these are subtitles within the first half of the lecture. By the way, there's a little handout there. You probably missed it coming in. Yep. Which is just the outline that I sent you also by email in case you want to take some notes in there. All right. Okay. Moving forward then. So we can look at variation at least from four different perspectives or four aspects, four angles, the morphology, the physiology at the molecular level, and also at the behavioral level, right? Because behavior is also can vary among individuals. Let me say this, uh, among individuals within the same species. And by the way, even plants have behavior. They certainly don't have a neurological system, but for example, a plant that is on the, a potted plant that is next to a window, naturally the leaves will tend toward the window physically. That's a behavior of the plant. It's called a tropism, when a plant moves physically toward the direction, the branches, the trunk, the roots, right? The structures move in a certain direction, that's called a tropism. And in this case, that's a phototropism because it's reacting positively toward light. Mm -hmm. 
the roots of a plant, for example, have a positive geotropism. They're reacting to gravity positively, going down toward the center of the earth, even though we know they'll never get there. <laughs> okay, so tropisms and tactisms in plants are behavior. So plants also have behavior. <laughs> and we can make the same argument for fungi at a more fundamental level. All right, so morphology, physiology, molecular, and behavior. There's variation. Right, so the standard, what I'm trying to say is the standard in nature is variation among individuals within the same species. Certainly, obviously, uh, between species also there's variation, but within the species, there's also variation, okay? And that's where selection is gonna act. So I think that if I can prove to you that there is variation among identical twins, there is also variation among every other individual of the same population, because there's nothing more close to each other than identical twins. They have essentially the same genome, right? I'm talking about what is known as monozygotic twins. And so we use the human as an example. And first I have to explain monozygotic twin in contrast to dizygotic twin. So monozygotic, is a reference to a single zygote, right? So here's the added value of the program, little Greek and Latin. Zygote is a Greek word. We'll look at it in more detail uh, in the next uh, course on the beginning of human life. But basically zygote comes from the Greek zygon, zygon, which means yoked or linked. We'll get into that for now. The zygote is the result of fertilization in whatever species. So egg plus sperm, one egg and one sperm fused together of the same species, they form a zygote, all right? And that's why it's represented here as the egg with the little tail of the sperm still fertilizing. <laughs> so the zygote is the universal first individual of any species, not just a human, not just animals, but also plants. Any individual, any species that reproduces sexually begins with the zygote because it's the product of fertilization. So we take an egg, a human ovum, fertilized with a human sperm, we have a zygote, okay? And there are genetic characteristics about that that I'm not gonna get into now, but I just wanna stay at the level of the cell. And so when we have dizygotic twins, di is a reference to two, Di, two, tri, three, tetra, four, penta, five, et cetera, right? That's the Greek and the Latin. So dizygotic means that there are two zygotes. What does this mean? It means that in that cycle, let's talk about the human, in that cycle, that woman ovulated two eggs, matured two eggs, could be one from each ovary or both from the same ovary. Uh, but the point is that she actually ovulated, she matured, two eggs at the same time in the same cycle. And what happened, because there are millions of sperm around, likely those two eggs are gonna get fertilized, right? By one sperm each. And so dizygotic twins are two eggs that got fertilized by two sperm and they're two individuals from the get-go, from the start, okay? And that's why they're called fraternal twins. You know that it is a sperm that is establishes the sex of the individual, whether it's X sperm or Y sperm. We'll get into that in a little more detail in the next course. But basically, fraternal twins can be both girls, can be both boys, or can be boy and girl. See? They can be both sisters, both brothers, or brother-sister. How do we get brother-sister? Because they're coming from two separate sperm. Different monozygotic twin. Monozygotic or identical twins is one egg. So that woman only ovulated one egg, the normal, the standard uh, ovulation, okay? Maturing one egg, fertilized by one sperm. And then within the first two weeks of embryonic development, within the first two weeks of embryonic development, that embryo has the possibility of splitting into two. 
two identical embryos. Of course, they have the same genetic material because they come from the same egg and the same sperm. So they got the same genetic package from mom and dad. But within the first two weeks, that uh, embryo can split into two embryos, who are, which are no, no, functioning normal and they're identical twins walking around the earth. Uh, it's one in 64, more or less. One in 64 humans is an identical twin. That's kind of the ratio. Uh, we'll get into more details about that uh, later, but just take my word for now that this can happen naturally, normally in humans. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. And these are two individuals with their own soul, with their own identity, uh, and they're necessarily both the same sex because they come from the same sperm. So they're either both girls or both boys. Question coming? When do we start the nomenclature change from zygote to embryo? Yes. So it depends if you're European or uh, American. <laughs> uh, in the Europeans, the they call embryo from fertilization to birth. But in the US, we make distinctions. We talk about the zygote, then we talk about the morula, the gastrula, uh, the blastula, and then gastrula, gastrulation. So there are four stages there, but the nomenclature is more specific. So it's either or, all right, either or. Uh, further, it changes from embryo to fetus, around the eighth week when we have all the organs formed in miniature. That's the end of gastrulation, let's say. All right, so we'll get into the technical wording. Uh, again, like I say, in the next course, the beginning of human life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see the difference here between dizygotic twins and monozygotic twins. I just want to emphasize that monozygotic twins come from the same genetic load. They have one package of DNA from their father, which is the sperm, and one package of DNA from the mother, which is the egg. All right, so these two, that's why they call identical in the sense that they have essentially the same genome, essentially. We would have to say almost identical, 99.99999% identical, all right? But they're not really fully identical, identical, identical. And I'm going to show you an example. So meet Claire and Laura Lewing. Lewing, I think they're teachers. Uh, so these are identical twins. It's quite obvious that they're identical twins. All right. And I'm going to show you how they are different. Morphologically, physiologically, molecularly, and behaviorally. Just from this one photograph. <laughs> it's in the detail. So. Morphologically, you can see that Claire is a little taller than Laura. <laughs> that interesting? Okay, just maybe an inch or two. It's hard to tell from the photo, but we can definitely tell. And I cut the photo here uh, at the tippy top of Claire's uh, head to show that she's slightly taller than Laura. Okay, and generally, what determines in gross morphology, what determines our height is mostly the length of the femur. <laughs> now, other bones in the body also contribute, right? Not the arms, for example, but uh, on the central axis. But the one that contributes the most to our height is the length of the femur because it's the longest bone in the body. So we can speculate that Claire's femurs are slightly longer than Laura's femur. So that's a morphological. We're just looking at the external, what we call gross morphology, G-R-O-S-S, -S, gross morphology. All right, so that's one variation right there. <laughs> okay, now, how about the physiology? Well, look at the freckles. Uh, I think it's quite evident that Laura, in this case, has more freckles than Claire. I don't know if there's an association with long femur and less freckles, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> but uh, just to plain sight, it's quite evident that uh, 
uh, Laura here has more freckles than Claire. And so that's a physio physiological phenomenon because the production of freckles is physiology on the skin, all right? Staying with that characteristic of freckles, we can take it down to the molecular level because we know that freckles are essentially an accumulation of melanin on the epidermis in the cells of the, uh, of the skin. All right, so that's the molecular proof <laughs> that uh, Laura has uh, a slightly different variant little more melanin than Claire, okay? And finally, behavioral. Again, it's so obvious that people miss it. Why can we say from this one photo that they have slightly different behaviors? Yes, the expression of the face, but that can change. Uh, the grades, holding the four cards? Sorry? Are they holding report cards? Yeah, I don't know. I think it was a certificate or something. Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see. I think it loses uh, resolution. If we, yeah, it becomes too blurry to see it. Well, the, the way of dressing is different. Exactly. We needed the woman in the group to tell us that they're dressing differently. Therefore, they have slightly different tastes for dressing, <laughs> at least for this photo. <laughs> So they did dress alike. And many times twins do dress alike if they want to emphasize their similarity, but if they want to emphasize their difference, they'll dress unlikely, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's so obvious that we miss it, but they do have, at least for this photo, different tastes in their uh, uh, dress, right? So there you go. Uh, also, the other thing is right hand, left hand, right? So they're holding the degree on opposite hands. <laughs> But that may just be for the photo itself. I don't know. It doesn't mean that they're right or left-handed. I suspect that they're both the same handedness, but I don't know. Right or left-handed behavioral That's what I don't know. Again, it's gonna be a combination, but we know that it's crossed with the brain, right? Uh -huh. The right-handedness, the center, the writing center is on the left and vice versa. So it does have a, a genetic uh, foundation. Okay, so uh, if, uh, if you take this as proof that even identical twins have variation in these four areas, then obviously any other individual of the same species would definitely have uh, even greater variation, right? Okay, so we move forward now and we're going to look at population and population range because the variation is what determines the range, right? Before understanding population range, we need to understand what is population from the biological perspective. We have covered this concept a little bit earlier, but I want to uh, rescue it because this is the basis for population biology, which is pretty much, it's a, bit, it's a standard of today's biology is population because it's more complicated. <laughs> you know, we can look at individuals, their anatomy, physiology, the structure and function, and so forth, and uh, even all the way down to the molecular level. But at the end of the day, in nature, in ecology, right, in the environment, it's populations that interact. Very seldom are there individuals. Sometimes we get lone, lone rangers, wolves, and some other species that for a time may be on their own. But generally, every species tends to cluster. Every individual within species, they tend to cluster, regardless of whether plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, you name it. So, Father, yes. Sorry, I have a question. Go for so, it. you refer to individuals in every species. That means, because I thought individuals were humans, but now we're saying individuals could be the organisms or the product of reproduction in any species. I'm sorry, Christina, again, I'm having difficulty understanding. There's a lot of blurry. Let's see, let's see if you can work with your mic a little bit. Try again. Can you hear me better? Maybe, try, keep going. Just kind of My question is, you, you said 
yes. individuals within the species. Yes. I thought individuals were only humans, but are we referring individuals as a, any organism as a product of reproduction, like the tulips, they're individuals, the, yes. uh, the tigers, lions, whatever is here, I don't know what they are. Right. They're all individuals? That's my question, that's it. Right, right, good, good, yes, because this is scientific language, okay, and it's important. So this photo here, of the lions, this is a lioness with three cubs, right? See three cubs, there's another one in the background here. So one, two, three, four. I don't know if you can see my little arrow, but here we have a lioness with three cubs. How many individuals are there? Christina. It would be four. Yes, that's it. So individual is a term that refers to any species. We can talk about individual human beings, but we have to qualify it. So we can talk about individual human beings. We can talk about individual lions. We can talk about individual tulips, okay? Individual bacteria, one bacterium, several bacteria, <laughs> all right? So individual is just a term that means one of the same species. Well, if we define it that way. So okay, a population perfect. is gonna be two or more individuals of the same species. That's what I was trying to get at. So you, you help me in the definition. Population is two or more individuals of the same species. So for example, here we have four individuals of the same species, four lions. Here we have, I'm not gonna count them, but we have a bunch of individuals of the same species, the tulip. And the humans of which now we are about four, uh, 8 billion. And I also mentioned that the humans, as far as I know, the human species is the only one that is considered one population, a single population throughout the whole earth, the 8 billion of us, okay? For example, let's say these, uh, this uh, lioness and her cubs. This is a little population. It's a little clan, right? It's a little um, pod of, of uh, little family of, uh, I don't want to use the word family because it's used in nomenclature. It's a group of four lions, the mom and her cubs. Let's say that this is in the Congo. But then we move to Ethiopia and we find the same species of lion, Felix Leo, Felix Leo, and another mom with three cubs. But now that, that pod, that little family is in Ethiopia, not in Congo. And it's unlikely that these two groups will interact with each other. We actually have two populations of lions of the same species, Felix Leo, all right? The same species, but two populations because they live in two different geographical regions. So when we talk about population, it's not enough to say to uh, two or more individuals. We also have to say within a local area, within the local region, whatever the range is, whatever the, their geographical range is, all right? Because you'll have different populations or several populations of the same species in different parts of the world or in different parts of the jungle, <laughs> all right? You can take it down to the smaller size, within a plant, they may be the same species of insects. Some live in the branches, some live down the trunk, you know, and those two populations, even though they're in, even in the same tree, may not interact with each other. And it's the same species of insects, but they live in two different areas, all right? Or two adjacent trees and so forth. So a population is not enough to say, two or more individuals of the same species, also we have to ground it. And that's why it's ecology. You see, within a particular geographical region, the geographical region very, very small, like the branch of a tree, or maybe large, like for example, the Grand Canyon for certain raptors, certain uh, large eagles or birds of prey that require, or a panther that require a large geographical territory. Yep. Would that be equivalent to the African elephant versus the Indian 
elephant? No, because those are two different species. They're actually different species. I don't know the actual name, the scientific name, but yeah, and it's mostly on the uh, ears, right? You notice that the African elephant has the large ears and the Indian elephant has the smaller ears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are actually two different species, but they're very closely related. It's obvious that they're closely related, right? Because <laughs> they look very similar. <laughs> okay, so the point here is that this is a population of Felix Leo with two, four individuals. This is a population of tulips with X number of individuals. All right. And this is a sample of the human population, <laughs> a small sample of the human population in an early stage of development, <laughs> the children <laughs> that are represented here, supposedly from different parts of the world. Right. But the, the, the point that I want to make with this photo is that we are the only species, as far as I know, that we consider one population simply because of our capacity to travel and to move, which is in this century with the airplane, within 24 hours, we can go around the world. So at least theoretically, an, a, an Asian man can mate with a South American woman if they meet up and they decide to do so, et cetera, et cetera. But in principle, there's nothing genetically that prevents them from mating, all right, at the biological level. And that's why it's considered one population because we span the whole earth mostly due to technology or the artifacts. Father, Father, a question here. Yes. Uh, you, you just explained that the, that the individual is, might be a, a found in, the, in different areas of the world. So like you, you just said, an Asian man meet with an um, American woman. Yes. Now that they, they they have they have a a child. How we will distinguish this uh, this individual between this kind of the the an Asian and American or whatever? Right. Okay. So let's uh, refine it a little bit. Thanks for the question, Father Franco. Let's refine it. Let's say that the Asian man is truly Asian. In other words, he was born in Asia, and he grew up in Asia, and he looks Asian physiologically and morphologically, right? With some general characteristics. So he has Asian ethnicity, but he's homo sapiens. So he has Asian ethnicity, he speaks Asian language and so forth. The South American woman, the same, she was born in South America. She grew up there liking the South American food and the language and the music and the culture. So she has, South American ethnicity. So their children will be interethnic, right? Depending on where the children grow, when they're where they're raised, that culture, whether wherever they're raised, is going to have a big influence on those children. Those children may be raised in North America or in Europe, <laughs> which is a third type of culture. But I'm sure the parents will have some kind of influence on the kids, at least subconsciously. For example, if the woman is cooking, she'll tend to cook Latin American food. <laughs> if the father is uh, playing sports with the kids, you know, maybe there's a particular sport that they play in Asia uh, that he's gonna teach his kids or the language. The language is the most obvious thing, right? And so the children will be intercultural, inter-ethnic to some degree, depending on many factors but the, the genes are there. But the point is on the part of similarity, they have the same genome. So they belong to the same species, Homo sapiens. On the part of culture, of course, you have variation, right? The uh, definition or mm -hmm. uh, concept. concept of the human being as one uh, population. population, specifically. Well, oh. would that then tie to our Catholic understanding of the pseudologic anthropology of the human individual and their biological right to migration? It can help for sure. We can we can um, glean we can glean 
all kinds of implications of the fact that we are now one human population. We weren't a single population before uh, the invention essentially of uh, transportation, but, but fast transportation, the, the airplane. By boat already for millennia, different ethnicities were mixing, but it's logical to, to see that the mix was greater among closer regions. And even by foot, we have been migrating since the beginning of time. In fact, the whole issue that we'll see uh, later in the course is migration out of Africa, right? So it's believed that the human species began in Africa, the genus, and migrated out of there and populated the whole world. So it's a gradual thing, but yes, you can glean all kinds of uh, natural rights that would come from the fact that we are one human population, the universal respect for human rights and things like that. You know, the right to migration within boundaries because the right to migration uh, in principle may be, uh, may be universal, but to migrate where, from where to where, the two, that country, that nationality may have restrictions and we have to respect those too. So we may have a right to migrate from, right? but not two, <laughs> because countries may, you know, you have a right to, we have a right to get out of our house, but not everyone has a right to come into our house. <laughs> so we have to work that out, <laughs> okay? All right, but the, so this whole concept, at least from the biological perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the biological perspective that the human population now is one human population. All right, and also uh, kind of uh, a little aside from that, another implication, why are we one human population? Because of the extensive capacity to travel, at least in principle, as long as we can buy the airfare ticket and, and they're traveling, you know, and we get the visa or whatever. <clears throat> also, artifacts, our technology, more and more is putting us out of natural selection is putting us out of natural selection, our technology, and specifically the practice of medicine, because the practice of medicine goes diametrically against natural selection. We're enabling the weaker, especially when it's pediatric med medicine, we're enabling the weaker to reach at least reproductive age. And if they mate, they will, in principle, in general, statistically pass on that weakness, <laughs> if it's a genetic weakness. And so the practice of medicine goes diametrically against natural selection, and yet we need to practice medicine. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an ethical imperative for a different reason. We'll get there. Let me point out, it's obvious, the variation among the kids is, is obvious, so the variation among humans is obvious. The variation among the tulips is obvious, at least on the color, and these are all the same species of tulip, but the color, you can see definitely a range there, right? from the most yellow to the most red and every range in between. <clears throat> How about the, these four individuals? They look pretty much alike. You can say they're probably identical, not necessarily. Uh, this is just a little blow up of these two faces. Look at the black spot inside the ear. Definitely bigger and smaller, right? So there's a little version, it's in the detail. <laughs> the devil is in the detail, okay? So by variation is in the detail. <clears throat> this to us may be accidental. So who cares if one cub has a larger black spot inside the ear than the other? Well, we may not care, but let's say that these two are males and maybe the female has a liking for darker ears than lighter ears. Maybe to the female that signals genetic fitness or vice versa. <laughs> Maybe the lighter ear is genetic fitness. It's instinct, but she may prefer light color ear versus dark color ear instinctively. It's a behavioral thing. Or it may be just accidental. It may have no, it may have no thing on, uh, on the mating. We know on the peacock, that the tail feathers definitely have an influence on the mating, right? The female is fixed, the peahen is fixated on the large exotic splendid tail. We call that runaway selection, okay? But you see, so it's in the detail. These two cubs may be similar to us in the gross morphology, but at the level of detail, I just pointed out one thing that uh, uh, 
we can see. Another one would be the smell. <laughs> you know, maybe these two guys smell a little different and the female may have a preference for one smell versus the other and so on and so forth, okay? Or maybe these two are females and the male, generally it's the female in nature that selects on the male. But uh, <clears throat> so you see at the level of detail, there's certainly variation among individuals that look very similar at first blush. So the rule then, the norm out there is polymorphism. Okay, polymorphism meaning many forms, many shapes, sorry. Morphism in biology meaning shape, all right? So many shapes, and here's an example. These are all guys of the same species, Canis lupus familiaris. So you notice that the dog is a subspecies of the wolf, okay? Canis lupus familiaris. And look at all the, what do we call these? Breeds. Right, we call them breeds. And they look very, very different from each other, but they're all the same species. Meaning that essentially they have the same genome. So if they can figure out the anatomy and the posture in principle, any one of these males could mate with any one of these females, if they can figure it out, <laughs> all right? But in principle, any one of these males can mate with any one of these females. All right, <clears throat> so that's polymorphism. And that's the standard in nature. So the all or none characteristics of Mendel are rare, but it served a, an excellent, it served an excellent purpose, which was to, for Mendel to come to the conclusion of the inheritance factor. Inheritance factors, which he couldn't see because he didn't have the instrumentation, today we call genes within the chromosomes, okay? So we have polymorphism. The standard is what we call a normal distribution or a Gaussian curve because this guy Gauss was a mathematician way back, discovered this and quantified it, gave it numbers. Again, the obsession with metrics, you put numbers to just, just concentrate on the size, just on the height of the, of the dogs here. And we can do a range of heights, right? From the tallest, obviously the shepherd and the smallest, the chihuahua, whatever that is. <laughs> and so we can do a range of heights. And most of them are going to be an average height. We can see here in the middle range, this is kind of the mid range. Most of the dogs are in the mid height, they would be here. And then there would be a few that are very short and a few that are very tall. Those are what we call the tails of the curve, the tails of the curve. It's also known as a bell-shaped curve because of the shape. <laughs> and uh, human population is the same. The average height for men, about 5'10", I think, is the average height for men or 5'9", and for women, five, seven or five, six, something like that. It's a moderate dimorphism, we'll get to it. But so you can see that polymorphism is a standard pretty much in nature, in humans, here it is. Uh, average height, okay. Uh, or, there we still have with this kind of um, the population, but we had the same on species. Yes. The, yes. Like, Yes, same species. In other words, all these dogs belong to the same species. The species is Canis lupus familiaris. In fact, it's a subspecies of the wolf, lupus, all right? So the, what I'm trying to say here is that historically, thousands of years ago, the wolf was domesticated. A male and a female wolf was domesticated and there began artificial selection on the offspring, on the cubs of those wolves began artificial selection for certain traits. Typically the first trait was for hunting, then the next trait was for defense and so on and so forth. And now the big, uh, the big selection, artificial selection on, do on dogs is for breed, for show, for aesthetics, for vain glory, <laughs> for the pleasure of it, you see? who can get the most extravagant dog and so forth for shows. But yeah, the standard is polymorphism, right? Always within the same species. So from uh, the short end to the tall end, that would be a range? 
Exactly, that's the range. All the individuals within that population, that's the range. Yeah, they can be out. Well, an outlier technically is one that is out off the curve, you know, is off the bottom of the curve. So this, this line actually, what describes the bell shape is an average, right? That's an average. Individual points are gonna be up or down. So if we populate this graph with the data, there will be individual points that will be up and down, up and down, but they will cluster around the slope. So this is a slope, which is an average. An outlier would be typically out here, out here, okay? Away out here. It's far away from the, from the slope, from the average. All right, so polymorphism is all over the place. Here are, these are all called heliconian butterflies. They're related actually to the dragonflies. As you can see, they're very similar in shape. Uh, to dragonflies, but they're not dragonflies, they're butterflies, they're, they're Lepidoptera. And uh, this is variants of the same species, as you can see. So in distributions, we can have a normal distribution. Again, keep in mind, this is the range, all the individuals within that population for whatever trait we're measuring. And we have to go trait by trait, phenotype by phenotype. We could be measuring height. Let's stick with humans. We can be measuring height of humans, or we can be measuring the, the uh, color of their skin, or we could be measuring the size of the face, or the ratio of the head to the body, or the length of the arms. Each characteristic is individual characteristic within the person. So we can, what trait are we measuring for? You know, what trait are we measuring for? So sticking with height or any trait really, there's a normal distribution, which typically is a standard in nature, but there are also skewed distribution. This is called positive skew because it's skewed to the left, toward the values, all right, to the left. A negative skew is skewed to the right. The, the standard in nature is a normal distribution, say the average height of trees from the tallest to the shortest tree of the same species, say the pine trees are slash pine, from the tallest to the um, shortest of the same age, right? Because obviously the juveniles are gonna be small, but of the same age, most of them are going to be mid range. And that's the top of the curve here, All right? So it's deceiving. Make sure you understand that it's kind of counterintuitive that this, the top of the curve here is most of the individuals. It's not the tallest individuals. It's most of the individuals by the numbers. Let's say for example, that this range is made up of 10 individuals, all right? Most of them are gonna cluster here, six. Yes, it's the average. So most of them, let's say six out of the 10 individuals form this. And then two individuals are very short and two individuals are very tall. But most of them are within the larger portion under the curve, All right? So this is by the numbers. In other words, the fact that you see a, a, a tallness here or a peak or a height, this does not mean that these are the tallest ones. The tallest ones are out here, all right? So understand graphs correctly, please. All right, so we have different types of distributions. Most of the distributions are normal. Sometimes we have what we call a binomial distribution or binormal, all right? And this is a bimodal, for example, is on the height between women and, and women because we can say that the average height of humans obviously is gonna be here, right? The average height of all humans without separating men and women. So the average height of all, a human is going to be 5.5 5, uh, feet, 5.5 5 feet. But no human is average, <laughs> half male and female. <laughs> you know, we're all either male or female. I'm talking genetically. And so, really, we have to look at the two um, groups, the two subgroups that form the human population 
by sex, male or female. And so we see that the male, the average height of males is 5.75 globally. The average height of females is 5.25. So that's actually a five inch difference from two to seven is five inch difference between the average height of male and female throughout the whole world. So that's what we call a dimorphism, dimorphism that is moderate. On average, most men are taller than most women across ethnicities throughout the whole one population of the world, okay? That's what we call dimorphism, it is slight. It is not dramatic, it is not um, um, high dimorphism. Like in the example of an extreme dimorphism is between the male gorilla and the female gorilla. The female gorilla is closer to the size of a chimpanzee. It's a little lady. And the male gorilla, we all have pictures of the male gorilla. <laughs> the male gorilla is like twice the size of the female gorilla, both of the same age, adults, <laughs> all right? So we have a moderate or slight dimorphism in the human population with regards to height, and it correlates to sex. Uh, in other species, there is no dimorphism. Some fish, you cannot tell from the external morphology between male and female, they're the same size. In others, you have extreme dimorphism. So even within dimorphism uh, in animals and plants, you also have a range. <laughs> So you have a range within species, you have a range among species. All right, now, a little uh, probability. Again, this is kind of background just to have us all on the same page because some of every, every cohort of, of this um, uh, program has been varied from the beginning. You know, you're the sixth cohort, uh, the sixth year that uh, we launched the program. And uh, we have on one extreme theologians, on the other extreme we have scientists and uh, other people who have some knowledge of those two backgrounds, but I wanna bring everyone back into the same basic background, all right? Or the same basic knowledge so that we can do uh, this a little more systematically. So uh, some very, very basic concept about probability. We need to talk about probability or statistical models. and. There are three ways of expressing the same number, either by fraction or by decimal or by degree, all right? Three ways of expressing the same number. It's a simple one, one half is equal to 50% and it's equal to 0 0.5, but we just say 0.5 because we reduce, we're reductionist. <laughs> and so we just say 0.5. When we say 0.5, it implies that there's a zero to the left. Zero to, zeros to the left of the decimal point don't count, <laughs> okay? So one half, 0.5 or 50% is easy. It's a little more complicated if I say one third, because then I got 33%, right? But it's not really 33%. It's 33.333%, we call it progressive. And in decimal also, it's 0.33 progressive. So the way to show that uh, progressive is just like this. I'm just gonna put it here for the ease. Oh, I don't know if I'm be able to do it. Uh, it has a little bar on top. I don't know how to do this in uh, that complicated, forget it. <laughs> uh, maybe I can do it in an Excel, in a Word. Oh no, I can do it in PowerPoint. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. I'm just going to search a new slide so I can show you how progressive is uh, uh, denoted mathematically. Uh, all right, that's the number. Let's just make it bigger for the heck of it. And now I just need a bar. And so this is how progressive is shown. Let's make this bar bigger. Uh, 
want the uh, width to get bigger. And then I'm going to narrow it down a little bit. Okay. There. So that's how progressive is shown. <laughs> little bar on top means that that same number keeps repeating at infinitum or ad nauseum or until the cows come home. All right. So that's how we represent. But you can see then that um, it's awkward, even though we have a notation for explaining it, but it's awkward to express it in decimals or in percentage, but it's very easy to express one third in fractions, all right? On the other hand, it gets complicated. If we express one uh, over 275, <laughs> it's more awkward. And we can probably come up with a decimal point of that that's easier. Anyway, interchangeable, we deal with this all the time and it's a mental exercise for the kids in class. So the probabilistic system is based on percentage or on average or percentage, you see, on probability. And what we have is we have two systems going on simultaneously. Now, normally we are more in tune with what we call the deterministic system. Contrasted to uh, deterministic system, right? Contrasted. What do we mean deterministic? See, each one of us is not a probability. <laughs> We're not a probability. We are a specific determined individual human being, all right? So we are in, the, we are determined. We, <laughs> we are a specific concrete existential human that exists here and now, physically and spiritually, et cetera. The problem is that medicine, for example, as an example of one science, is probabilistic. A doctor will never say, well, uh, you're going to die from this cancer. You know, they'll say you have a 90% chance of death and a 10% chance or 50%, let's put 50% chance of recovery with this particular therapy. What are they basing the 50%? They're basing the 50% on history. In other words, Individuals like you with your cancer that have gone through this treatment, 50% have been cured so far. So you see it's a statistical model. It's based on probability. But the problem is that the patient in front of them is not a probability. <laughs> so until we cross that threshold, we never know which side of the probability we're at. Once we cross the threshold, then we have contributed to the statistic one way or another. For example, globally, about 3% of the human population has died of COVID which means that the 97% of us are still walking around, right? But until I get COVID and survive, I don't know which side of the probability I'm gonna be at. <laughs> and that's the forever quandary that in order a population biology deals is the stuff of daily life is a statistical, it's a probabilistic system because they're looking at numbers. But yet those numbers are made up of individuals. So there's a chance, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that there's also a chance element inside intrinsic to the theory of evolution, there's also chance. And chance occurs at the level of mutation, which is amazing. It can be compartmentalized, but it also at other levels, but mostly at the level of mutation. Because mutations, we say they are random. They're not directed. It's not artificial selection. We're not in a lab generating mutations on bacteria. This is nature hitting, getting hit by ultraviolet radiation that is being filtered through the clouds and so on and so forth. But as soon as we step outdoors, we're exposed to that radiation to some degree, all right? Then some more concepts. The mean or the average, this is what we call a geometric mean, all right? Or an arithmetic mean. There are other types of means, but this one, the average is a simple mean is the arithmetic mean which is the sum of the individuals divided by the number of individuals, <laughs> okay? So the sum of individual numbers, let's see, how many dogs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 dogs, okay? So 
what is the average number of German shepherds in this group? The average number of German shepherds is one over 12. That's the average number of German shepherds. And the average number of poodles is also one over 12. In fact, all dogs, all these different breeds have the same average because they're all individual breeds. If there were two shepherds here, let's change this, whatever this is, uh, Eskimo, whatever it's called, Malalut, change that guy with another German shepherd. Now we got two out of 12 are German shepherds, hypothetically, right? Two out of 12, which is, can be reduced to one out of six. So there's twice the number of German shepherds that there is the number of any other dog in here. See how it works? That's just basic statistics, okay? So it's the number of individuals divided by the number of individuals. <laughs> you figure it out. But it, it depends on the trait that we're looking at. It depends on the trait. That's what gives us the mean or the average. Then the range is all of the individuals, all of the observation within that population or within that sample of the population. Sometimes it's a sample of the population. The standard is 100 individuals. That's just because it's easy because 100 individuals make 100%, okay? So the standard is 100 for the sample of the population, but it depends. If I only have 80 cheetah in the entire population of Africa, I cannot get 100. So the sample becomes the population. If I'm actually sampling all 80 cheetah, that's the whole sample. That's the whole population. It's not a sample, it's a population. But if I'm sampling 100 humans out of 8 billion humans, that's a sample, and that's a rather small sample of the whole population of humans. And by the way, that number is the one that was used to determine the human genome for all population. <laughs> for the human population, the 8 billion, it was 100 individuals that were sequenced, 100 individual DNAs for the human genome project. And that's the standard where the, all the labs of the world that are doing human genetics are mining that sample of 100 individuals for a whole population. <laughs> Hopefully they didn't all come from the same town in the same rural place of, uh, of uh, Northern Canada, <laughs> okay? Supposedly they came from 100 different ethnicities or something like that. I've heard that Craig Venter, who was one of the things, was one of them. <laughs> all right, so we get it here. We are all, oh, sorry. So range is all the individuals within that population, whatever characteristic we're looking at, whatever trait. And then variant is each individual. So let's go back to our dogs. What's the range of these 12 dogs? The range is 12 dogs, okay? What's the variant? The individual 12 dogs. <laughs> each dog is a variant of the whole population or sample. This is a sample of all dogs, right? So this is a sample of all dogs. And what is the range of the sample? 12. The individual variance, one over 12, because we can see that each dog in here is obviously from a different breed, but the same species. So going back to the nomenclature, the range of the dogs of that sample is 12, and the variance is one, each one over 12, is one over 12, right? For, and what are we selecting for here, or what are we measuring here? We can measure height, but we could also measure height for each one of these breeds, right? We're also measuring uh, breeds. The most obvious one is actually, it's so obvious that we miss it. But the most obvious difference between these guys is breed. For example, between these, uh, is this Malalut? Between these two guys, they're fairly the same height, right? And uh, these two guys are close. Well, these two guys don't have the same height, but uh, uh, maybe these two guys have close to the same height. So more obvious difference is breed. And sometimes, sometimes it's so obvious that we actually miss it. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that's uh, the terminology. So now when I talk about probabilistic system, when we talk about mean and average, you understand, when we talk about range of a population or range of a sample and the variant within the range is gonna be always the individual, whatever characteristic, whatever trade we're looking at. 
So we could look at external traits, the gross morphology, or we could look at internal traits, or we could look at the metabolism. Identical twins, they might have different metabolism. One may have some kind of intolerance, lactose intolerance, and the other one may not, all right? My, one may be diabetic and the other one may not. We don't know, that's down to the genetic level, okay? Those mutations may have occurred spontaneously. And so uh, variants are all over the place. The standard really, the starent is variants. These two are variants of each other. Sophisticated, detailed, but if we're measuring for freckles, they definitely have a different number of freckles. So they're variants. And if identical twins are variants, then every other individual of any species is also a variant <laughs> because you cannot get more close genomically than identical twins. The package, the load is the same, genetic load. So speaking of genetics, again, three other words that are, um, again, we're building up the language, right? The nomenclature, genotype. The genotype is the genetic makeup. The genotype is a genetic makeup associated with genes, all right? So the DNA molecule, the chromosomes, that's the genotype. Those genes may or may not express, depending if they're dominant, recessive, or many other uh, environmental factors, okay? But the genotype is a genetic makeup. It's in the, gene, in the chromosomes, in the genes, at the DNA level, within the nucleus of every cell of our body, except mature RBCs, mature red blood cells, they ditch the nucleus and that's why they don't last as long. But every other cell in the body, practically they have a nucleus within the nucleus is the genetic makeup, is the genotype, right? Phenotype is the expression of the genotype. So the phenotype is the expression and those are the observable characteristics, again, at these four levels, at the morphologic, physiologic, molecular, or behavioral level. See, so the genotype, we can talk about morphologic genotype. In the case of Claire and Laura, one morphologic uh, phenotype is the height. One molecular phenotype is the amount of melanin, all right? And one behavioral phenotype, phenotype, phenotype is their um, preference for dress, All right? So that the phenotype is the observable trait or characteristic for now. Trait is a is more uh, proper term, but the phenotype is not just external like uh, Mendel was looking at, the things that you can actually see with his naked eye, the color of the pea, the size of the plant, but we can take it down to the molecular level now with instruments, of course. And we can also look at behavioral level, which can also be measured or quantified. Then the genome is the complete DNA sequence of each cell in an organism. So the genome encases the genotype. The, the, the genotype is embedded, let's say, in the genome, but the genome is bigger, okay? The genome is all the DNA sequence in each one of our cells. And think about this. The genotype is about the genes, right? The actual genetic makeup, the genes. Those genes, the sum total of the genes in our DNA is only about 3% of our DNA. So the other 97% is what we call junk DNA, junk because it doesn't code for any particular protein. We don't know yet the function of that junk DNA. There's some speculation, but that has not been fully elucidated yet. I worked on that in my second PhD when I was at Purdue, the relationship between structure and function of DNA at the higher order level, at the larger size, all right? But keep in mind that the genotype is within the genome, but the genome includes more DNA than just the genes. It includes also what we call non-coding regions, regions of the DNA, of the DNA molecule, of the chromosomes that don't code for any particular protein. 
So they're not genes as such. So it's a gene by definition codes for a particular protein. All right, so let's look at that structure a little bit. Father, please. I have one question. Okay. So we could, in probability, in what you're saying with the um, DNA, the molecular, morphological, and physic physiological is in the DNA, but how about the behavioral? Is that also there? Uh, you're talking about the genes? Mm -hmm. Well, the genes. Technically speaking, of these four categories, where would you put genes fair and square? Just gene by itself, before expressing, before actually uh, making the protein, just the gene inside the DNA by itself, structurally, where would you put it? Well, it goes in the nucleus, right? Molecular, it's molecular. Okay. okay. See, it's molecular because it has not expressed yet. It may or may not express. So we can say that both Claire and Laura have the genes for preckles, but maybe they have another, let's say they have a brother who is also a twin, but it's a fraternal twin. So in addition to the identical twins, they have Samuel who is a fraternal twin because Samuel is obviously a male and not a female. All right, so that woman at that time actually produced two eggs, mature, uh, ovulated two eggs, both were fertilized. One of those zygotes split into identical twins and the other zygote did not split. And Samuel was the result of that, okay? So Samuel doesn't have any freckles, but he may have the freckle gene, but it hasn't expressed because it's recessive. Let's load the basis. Maybe it's only on the mother. The mother, Maria, is the mother of Claire and Laura and Maria has freckles. But David, who's the father, who's the husband of Maria, doesn't have any freckles. <laughs> so maybe, uh, I don't know, probably not, but maybe freckle gene is sex linked. <laughs> maybe. There are some sex linked characteristics that I'll show you uh, come, going further down, all right? But uh, to your question, sometimes I just complicate it too much, I, I go overboard. But basically the genes just by themselves structurally are part of the molecular uh, uh, phenotype, right? No, the genotype is the gene itself. When it expresses, it becomes part of the phenotype. So actually, we can see here that the molecular phenotype of the gene is the protein or the polypeptide sequence that that gene codes for, okay? So the phenotype of one gene is the first level of phenotype. The first level is going to be molecular. It's going to be the protein sequence that that gene expresses. That protein sequence will, if the protein sequence becomes a functional protein and does something in metabolism, for example, it's the code for we have the gene for um, insulin, all right? So the protein is insulin, that's the molecular. If that protein functions correctly, then the insulin production is a proper physiology that individual is not diabetic, <laughs> all right? There may or may not be a morphological thing of that. Let's take a defective, uh, let's take a decef, this defective insulin gene. The genotype is the defective gene. The phenotype at the molecular level is a defective insulin protein. It will be a defective physiological function, which is diabetes. And eventually the morphological is the, the thing that happens with the toes. They start uh, becoming necrotic with one of the expressions of advanced uh, diabetes, necrosis of the toes, no? Okay. Behavioral, gotta get my toes cut. Otherwise, the necrosis would advance. Okay, what's that? So the genotype then is the combination of the morphological, physiological, molecular, and behavioral. No, it's pre. The genotype is pre. It's before. Yes. Exactly. Right. 
Okay, so phenotype is the expression of genes. Genes may or may not express. You know that we have these oncogenes and proto-oncogenes. In fact, they don't express because they express into cancer. So the proto-oncogenes, we have them, they're recessive, they're in there, and thank God they don't express. So most of the gene is actually shut down most of the time. Because the genome is the complete DNA sequence of all the genes that we have. It's estimated between 20 and 30,000 gene, uh, genes that we have, okay? So 20, 30,000 genes, but when you fit that into the 3 billion base pairs of the molecule, uh, that's only about 3% by sequence, all right? The other 97% does not code, is what we call nonsense coding. They don't, it doesn't have triplet, they doesn't have a triplet that, that um, codes for a particular amino acid. It's nonsense. And so it doesn't code for a particular protein, but it's there, all right? And that's why you call it junk, but in quotations, because that at the higher level of the DNA on the actually three-dimensional conformation, it may have an influence. On, on the expression of those genes. Let me go one more slide because this may clarify a little bit more. Think about this. Here's the genotype. Oh, okay, so I have slides to give you an example of each. The genotype is the actual DNA sequence as you see here, all right? Now this is what we call the uh, double helix or the twisted ladder. Think just of a ladder, aluminum ladder, and we're super strong and our arms are super long and we take this ladder and we twist it in opposite direction at each end. We get a twisted ladder, no, physically. Uh, and that's what it looks like. Twisted ladder has rails and has rungs or uh, steps, right? Rails and steps. So the twisted ladder DNA has a double uh, rail, double rail, as you can see here. Here, the twisted ladder has been unwound and flattened out for the purpose of illustration, to show the sequence, the actual sequence, all right? So that twisted ladder is the first level of coiling. Then that twisted ladder, which is very long between, because it has 3 billion of these little letters, 3 billion of them, 10 to the nine, all right? It's an extremely long ladder. If we were to take out just one, um, DNA molecule from a single cell in our body. Let's say, look at the back of your hand. You see skin, right? We see skin. We can see the smallest thing we can see is tissue. We cannot see individual cells, but they're there. Okay, so microscopic cells within the microscopic cell is a microscopic nucleus. Within the microscopic nucleus is the DNA molecule. When it's inside the nucleus like that and the cell is not reproducing, we call it chromatin, right? Chromatin. If we were to take out one chromatin molecule, which is all the DNA in that one cell, take out that chromatin molecule and hypothetically stretch it out like this in front of us, how long would it be? It would be about six feet long, two yards, two meters, two meters. And six feet is about an arm length and a shoulder length. It doesn't matter which side, <laughs> okay? So that's about six feet. No, that's one yard actually, that's one. Hey, that's six feet. Yeah, that's six feet. So how come this looks? No, that's three feet. Yeah, three feet, but six feet. Yeah, it's double. Yeah, six feet is a tall person. Yeah, right. So two of these. <laughs> that's how tall. That's how long the DNA molecule would be, maintaining its double helix. Okay, we have not flattened out, maintaining its double helix. Mm, but the flat out of the double helix itself is about the same size because the, the, the space between the bases is the same base. So that's the, that's the first level of coiling. That molecule, how come that fits inside a, a nucleus of a cell, which is super microscopic? Well, because that DNA molecule winds around a little ball of proteins. Those proteins are called histones, all right? And it's four pairs of proteins or eight, a total of eight proteins that form the subunits that form the, the little ball of uh, histones. It's, eight uh, proteins, four pairs of proteins, uh, all right? H1, H2, et cetera. And so the DNA winds around almost two times, 1.7 times, two, way too much detail, but think of a little yo-yo with a DNA around, okay? And then it goes on to the next uh, histone cluster and it winds around there almost two times and then it shoots out and winds around another one and so forth. All right, so that we have these little functional units 
of histone proteins and DNA wound around it almost two times. That's called a nucleosome, a nucleosome. And that's the functional unit of DNA. The functional unit of DNA is the nucleosome, which is a complex of histone proteins with DNA wound around it almost two times. Is a functional unit of DNA, the functional unit of DNA or chromatin, right? And we also call this arrangement beads on a string, colloquially beads on a string. So you think of a, a pearl collar, right? Uh, um, a collar of pearls. It has a pearl and then a little string and a pearl and string. Those are beads on a string, right? That's what it's called. It's, it's just a, an analogy. So the nucleosome is a functional unit, it means that this is what allows the genes to be expressed or not expressed. But this stabilizes the DNA molecule. It stabilizes it, all right? So when we have this compaction, this is the first level of compaction, or now we're going into super coiling. Then you can see that those beads of the string coil around themselves. So this pearl color, this pearl color has thousands, millions of pearls. Wow, millions of pearls, okay? Very long. And that pearl color is gonna start winding upon itself in a very organized fashion in a structure that we call the higher order structure and makes this kind of configuration. You can think of it in a 3D form, three-dimensionally, just take a very long pearl collar and start winding it upon itself. You get kind of a tube of pearls, right? And then that tube of pearls is again gonna wind up upon itself. This one is called the 30 nanometer structure. Don't worry about that, but it keeps winding upon itself, upon itself, and upon itself until eventually we get to the chromosome, which is the most compact DNA molecule, the most compact, okay? And it's similar to taking a rubber band from both ends and twisting it in opposite direction. And you know how you bring it together and it forms a clump, all right? It forms a clump. That is compaction. Uh, <clears throat> that is compaction. So how do we get two meters six feet molecule inside a nucleus of a cell by the process of compaction. Let me see the paper just to show you. <coughs> compaction is a folding upon itself, right? And so here's a sheet of paper. I fold it in half. So I have reduced the surface to half, right? I fold it in half again. So that's a second fold. Now this sheet of paper has been folded twice. Three times is getting to the size of a credit card. Now maybe I can fit that in my wallet. This thing expanded. I cannot fit this into a wallet without sticking out. Right, so there's compaction. One fold, two fold, three fold, right? Four fold, five fold, six fold. Anyone want to fold that again? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Try to fold that again. <laughs> six fold without any machinery. <laughs> All right, that's what we call compaction. The level of compaction of the DNA to fit inside the nucleus is about 10,000 times. And that's another, so when we run out of words in, uh, in science, we call it elegant. <laughs> that's the elegance of DNA, 10,000 fold compaction. And that's also what we call the super coiling, super, super, super coiling, okay? And that's how we go from the primary sequence, like the primary structure is this, the actual sequence, all the way to the functional chromosome or chromatin when the, phase, when the, when the cell is metabolizing, when the cell is producing proteins to do their function. 
All right, 10,000 fold compaction is just astonishing. And it's all because of the functional unit, this nucleosome. So you can see that DNA is wound upon itself very tightly. And if we have to read the sequence to produce a phenotype out of that, it's highly unlikely. And it's a good thing because what do we have? In the entire chromatin molecule in, that, in those six feet, we have all the genes of the entire body. The 20,000 genes are in every molecule of DNA in our body. So all the trillions of cells that we have, each individual cell has the entire genome in it, each individual cell. So you again, look at the back of your hand, all the skin there. Now there are cells, we know that they're individual epithelial cells, right? Each one of those cells is alive. Well, there's a layer of dead skin, right? I go beyond the layer of dead skin, the live skin. There are cells adjacent to each other. And there's a nucleus in each one of those cells. And inside of each one of those nuclei, the entire genome is there, the entire 20,000 genes. And so, but yet the skin cells are only skin cells and the liver cells are only liver cells and the brain cells are only brain cells. So it means that only the skin genes are expressing in the skin cells and only the neuronal genes are expressing in the, in the uh, brain cells and only the liver genes are expressing in the liver. So we can say that the 20,000 genes, most of the human genome is shut down most of the time, okay? Most of the human, or rather most of the genotype is shut down most of the time. And that's a good thing. Otherwise, our liver will be expressing skin and neurons and toes and every other part of the body. And it will be total chaos. And instead of chaos, we have order. What do we call order in nature? We call it metabolism, we call it life. So the chemical reactions that are occurring and in a very orderly fashion, in fact, cascades. One reaction leads to another, to another, and to another. That's metabolism at the cellular level, right? And so in order for that order to occur, most of the genome has to be shut down most of the time. And only little tiny regions of individual genes need to be expressed at particular times. So when the pancreas needs to make insulin, it will get a signal that the sugar content just rose in the bloodstream because I just ate a delicious ice cream. And so I'm pumping glucose into my bloodstream. That bloodstream, part of that bloodstream is getting to the pancreas. The pancreas is detecting glucose, high glucose, alert, alert, produce insulin. It gets the signal and it will read the, G, the gene for insulin and it will start expressing that gene, hopefully in a healthy way, and so the insulin will get out there and start metabolizing my glucose and bring it down to normal. See, so there's a cascade of reactions that occur in a very elegant orderly fashion to maintain life. But most of the genome has to be shut down most of the time in most of our cells in the body. And that allows for life, for order to occur. And that argument is not unique to the humans, obviously is unique to every animal plant down to the bacterium every single bacterium that is alive right now, okay? Interesting, huh? How can there not be a God? <laughs> well, and the skeptical will say, well, priest, you just explain it elegantly. So how could there be a God? There's a total mechanical explanation for it. <laughs> and the dog keeps chasing his tail. <laughs> All right, so here's the diagram. Now we're gonna to go to phenotype. After I breathe for a moment. <laughs> so. Here's the phenotype. And these are two variants of the earlobe, which is one of those rare characteristics of all or none that we have. This is one of those Mendelian characteristics, the few Mendelian characteristics that we have in our body, at least at the morphological level that we can look at without having to experiment on the individual or open them up or anything like that, okay? Is the earlobe is either attached or detached, hanging, right? Called free, free earlobe or attached earlobe. That's either all or none. I actually knew one fellow one time that I looked at him and said, mm, mm. I looked at the left and I looked at the right and he had one attached and one detached. <laughs> it's very rare. It's obviously a mutation. 
but uh, I've only win one in my whole lifetime. <laughs> the rest of us are both attached or both detached, all right? That's a phenotype. It's an expression. This, this is the most obvious one that we're looking at. What level is this? Is this behavioral? No, the earlobe is just sitting there, right? So uh, is it uh, morphological? Yeah, it's a morphology. It's a, the gross morphology, right? The anatomy. Physiological, well, physiological during the embryonic stage when the, when the earlobe was produced during the fetal stage, <laughs> okay? And molecular, yeah, because it has to be a gene that expresses this somehow, right? But this is basically an example of phenotype. It's the expression of a genotype. The genotype is either attached or free earlobe gene, whatever that gene is. Typically, it's gonna be most likely a cluster of genes or something like that. Okay. How about the genome as a whole? So the genome, remember, is bigger, all right? Let's say all the students at St. Thomas University, we have about 2000 students, not all are studying the masters in genetics, okay? So you are the genotype of the genome of students in St. Thomas University. Other students are studying other careers, and so those are other genes or gene clusters. So the entire DNA sequence of all the chromosomes is what we call the genome. This, by the way, is called a karyotype, simply because it shows the karyo, karyo being a reference to the nucleus, what's in the nucleus, the chromosomes. And we have, since we're at it, uh, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, all right? total of 46 chromosomes that make up the human genome. So you hear about the human genome, 46 chromosomes, or 23 pairs. Now, of the 23 pairs, which is 46 into two, one pair is the sex chromosomes. One pair, those are called the sex chromosomes. The other 22 pairs do not determine the sex, and therefore, they are non-sex chromosomes. They're called autosomes, okay? I don't know why, but they're non-sex chromosomes. They're called autosomes. So we got 22 pairs of autosomes and one pair of chromosomes. Again, at the level of the morphology, and they're classified by size, by the way. So again, it's kind of a gross morphology at the molecular level, all right? They're classified from one through 22 by size. Remember I said one through 22, all right? In other words, the autosomes. So the largest one by size, the longest pair of chromosomes is chromosome one, pair one. And the smallest is actually 21, not 22. Little detail that makes a difference with regards to Down syndrome. So little detail. The smallest, if you can see here in detail, there we go. Can you see slightly that pair 21 is actually smaller than 22? It's hard to tell, but take my word for it. It is. Look at the legs. All right. The P and the uh, P, and, uh, P and Q legs. So 21 is actually a little smaller than 22. See so detail now without its consequence. Uh, so they're by size. This is a normal karyotype. This is normal. It's now Down syndrome is syndrome 21, which is a reference to chromosome 21. There's a third chromosome 21, a third chromosome. It means that typically on the mother's side, uh, her egg had 22, had two chromosomes 21 instead of just one at two. And then the one from the father made the three. And that makes trisomy 21. We'll talk about trisomies more in detail, but I'm just pointing it out here as a detail, as a curiosity for now in genetics and the genome, that the chromosomes are numbered by size, beginning with the number one, the, long, the longest ones, and number 21, the smallest one, 
Why? Because 100 years ago, more or less, when the karyotypes were invented, right, to classify the chromosomes, the microscopes were not that sophisticated. And it seemed like 21 was smaller than 22. For that particular individual, when they were doing the classification originally, right? Certainly 21 and 22 are very close in size, definitely smaller than 20, all right? So they can tell the difference between these and 20. But then between 21 and 22, they were not sure, and it happens that they erred. <laughs> they called 21 the smallest one. Now with more sophisticated uh, microscopes, we can see that actually 22 is a little bigger. Or it could be that for that one individual, they were so close you know, when they were doing the karyotyping. You can see that actually the karyotype is done that, like that. You can see actually there are little squares around them, the little rectangles, because these are photographed inside the, uh, they're photographed inside uh, the nucleus. They're stained, first of all, they're stained with, a, with a, probably DAPI or some kind of a uh, stain that stains the DNA. And then a photograph is taken. And then that photograph is printed, not a 3 brief printer, just a good old printer, okay? Black and white printer. And then physically they're cut out <laughs> and pasted together. So you can see not only is there a rectangle, around the pair, but actually the individuals, this one is more obvious here. You can see the individual cut and paste, literally, not figuratively, but literally cut and paste to paste them together and make up that karyotype. See, <laughs> that's how a karyotype is done. Today, of course, this can be done digitally on the computer and a PowerPoint presentation, and they, can, they don't have to print it physically and cut it with a pair of scissors, right? Wow. See. They all contain the same genetic material? Yes, the pair. That's the duplication. That's the duplication. So we talk about chromosome pairs and the genes are paired. So we have pair genes. So we have a pair of genes for insulin, for insulin production. We have a pair of genes for each one. The trick is that of the pair, one may be dominant, the other one may be recessive. And so that's, it's a backup essentially. So I have inherited the dominant from my dad and the recessor from my mom. I'm okay because the dominant will express. The recessor will not express. It may have a mutation or something like that. I will not express, but the dominant will express. So I'm okay. So it's a duplication, right? The problem is in, at the level of egg and sperm where there are no duplicates. And so those cells are extremely delicate. If they receive UV or high heat, they can mutate and there's no backup. So that mutation may be passed. And that's why they put the lead uh, shirt <laughs> on the abdomen, the abdominal region when they're taking a photograph of the thoracic region, uh, an X-ray, <laughs> so that our genitals don't get bombarded with the X-ray. <laughs> Father, sorry. I, I am so sorry because my questions, I am really, this is all new for me. So what, what we, what you are saying is that this photograph is of a one of the 22,000 um, cells or DNA genome that there is in each of those uh, circle or bolt or whatever, you, how you call it, where they round up? The nucleosome? So okay. Exactly. Not exactly. This is a simplified diagram. Actually, most of the cells in our body are not reproducing. Most of the cells in our body, if they're not reproducing, what are they doing? They're not taking a nap, they're metabolizing. They're functioning, right? So let's think of the liver. The liver is, uh, well, let's stick with the pancreas, which is the pancreas is producing insulin, all right? So the pancreatic cells, the islets, they are metabolizing, but periodically, some cells have to reproduce because they're getting old, they're wearing out. So every now and then cells reproduce in the body from different tissues and the tissues are replenished that way. When the cell goes to reproduction, which is gonna be an asexual reproduction, mitosis, a splitting from one cell into two, all right? 
when the cell goes into reproduction, it stops metabolism and it concentrates on reproduction. So the chromatin will concentrate even more, will compact even more into the most compact possible conformation, which is the chromosome. And that's when we get distinct chromosomes. But when the cell normally is in our body functioning, what we call metabolism or body functioning, the cell is not reproducing, it's doing its function in the body, right? It's body function. The chromatin is a single molecule. And that's when we have the 20,000 genes all together in that one molecule that is six feet long if we were to expand it, all right? So inside the cell, when the cell is functioning, we have the one humongous molecule of chromatin. And you stop here. But when that cell is going to reproduce just by mitosis, by splitting into two, first it has to, the chromatin is gonna chop up into 46 pieces. Each one of those pieces is a chromosome. And now the cell is ready to duplicate, to uh, reproduce. Okay, but it stops metabolism because now the whole concentration is on reproduction. Okay, we'll cover reproduction in more detail just in a couple of months when we get into the next uh, course. All right, at the beginning of human life, we'll go into this in greater detail. But keep in mind that this diagram is really like it's a, it's a collage, it's a composite diagram. But really, if we have chromatin, we don't have chromosomes. If we have chromosomes, we don't have chromatin. In other words, the chromatin has undergone a further compaction and fragmenting into individual chromosomes. And that's what we see here. So the individual chromosomes, this had to be done on a cell that was reproducing to get the individual chromosomes. Now, let's go back to the 20,000 genes, which are distributed in here. Each one of these chromosomes has X number of genes, you know? So we would split, let's make the math simple. Let's say that we have 20,000 genes in 20 pairs. So that's a uh, thousand genes per, per pair. So there would be on average a thousand genes, but on average, an average a thousand genes. Actually, the ones who would have a thousand genes would be the mid-size gene, the mid-size chromosomes. The longer chromosomes, will have more genes on average, two or 3,000. The smaller chromosomes will have fewer genes, maybe just a few hundred genes, see? If we just distribute them arithmetically, they're not distributed arithmetically. There are some regions of the, of the chromatin where there's a cluster of genes, a high concentration of genes. Then for a long segment, there's no genes. And so really, genes are clustered, it's a standard, it's not distributed homogeneously. But we can still make the argument that on average, the longer chromosomes have more genes than the smaller chromosomes on average, okay? And that's why Down syndrome babies are compatible with life because that third chromosome that they have is an extra load of genes for whatever chromosome 21 is coding even if it's just a few hundred or even a few dozen. But because it is the smallest chromosome, on average, it has a fewer number of genes. And so to have an extra load of those genes is still compatible with life, all right? Now it does have a range of expressions, morphologically and behaviorally, as we know, for the Down syndrome, they used to be called mongoloid because they look a little bit like Mongo people with the slanted eyes and uh, the, the lip and so forth. But the, in general, the genes that are on chromosome 21, an extra load is still compatible with life. They tend to have a shortened lifespan, so it does have an impact on the long term, all right? They don't live the average lifespan that we have on average about 80 years of age or 78, you know, but it's compatible with life. That third chromosome, these trisomies can occur with any of the 23 pairs, with any of the 23 pairs. 
So why don't we see trisomy one? Why don't we see trisomy four? We do see trisomy 18. There are a few others that we do see. In general, we don't see them is because on larger chromosomes, the load is too much. The overload is too much. And generally those little embryos die. It's not compatible for life. They're selected out. The abnormalities are too gross and they die. The liver doesn't form well. The kidneys don't form well. The heart is not pumping well. So they die in utero, what do we call that? A spontaneous abortion or a miscarriage. Some kind of chromosomal abnormality, including the trisomies. But for 21, because it's the smallest, has the smallest load, it's compatible generally with life, okay? It also can happen with the sex chromosomes, by the way, where you get XYY, the super male, Kleinfelter syndrome or Turner syndrome, their syndromes, okay? Or you can have XXY, you know, like the super female, ambiguous genitalia. Typically they're sterile, so they're a dead end. They don't pass that abnormality on, but they are generally compatible with life. And those are also syndromes that occur on the sex chromosomes, all right? So you see that the picture, I can giving you kind of a simplistic thing here. It does get more complicated, but all I want to rescue from here is the terminology. Autosomes, 22 pairs, and the one pair are the sex chromosomes. These are the ones that determine the sex. And specifically, so this guy is an XY. And why is the Y called Y? Because it's a smaller one. And it's not really missing one of the tails. The tail is there, it's just too short. So it looks kind of a Y. And the other argument that I heard historically, why is the Y chromosome called Y? Not necessarily because it's missing one of the tails, which is not, they're just very short tails, is rather because it's the letter that follows X. And so where was naming them? X, Y. In birds, it's the opposite. Instead of Y, they have what they call a Z chromosome and it's on the female. So the Z, they have X, X or X, Z. And the C is the female <laughs> instead of the the XC is the female instead of XY being male here. And Y is called Z because it follows Y, <laughs> all right? So that applies to birds and maybe reptiles because birds are derivatives of reptiles, right? Because the Y follows X, X, Y, Z on the alphabet. It's not necessarily that it's missing a tail because the tails are there, but they're very tiny. I can also tell you the Y chromosome over time is disappearing. It has fewer and fewer genes. It basically has the SIR gene, the SRI gene, which is determined uh, maleness, <laughs> you know, so without an X, if you have an XO, it's going to express as female, but this functional female, because a little bit of testosterone is needed for the female to have a normal life and have a normal ovulation, <laughs> and a little of, of estrogen is necessary on the male also to be a normal male, <laughs> so it's a balanced thing, very, very balanced, again, the devil in the detail, but so is God in the detail, Mendel, Mendel, uh, what we call Mendelian traits, which are all non characteristics, very few really in nature. That's why some people suspect that Mendel, with all due respect, may have not really cheated, but he may have experimented with other plants before he got to the pea plant because he was looking for all or non characteristics. He was not looking for polymorphism because in polymorphism, you don't know. <laughs> who is giving what, right? So he, when he was mixing, let's say he was mixing purple flower plants with white flower plants. And if he got pink, reject, because he can't interpret it. Who's giving what? But if he's mixing purple flower with white flower and he's getting three purple and one, and one white, and no white and no pinks, now he can deal with that mathematically. See, that's the genius in Mendel the mathematical genius, this ratio three one and no intermediates, that is pointing to that inheritance factor because all I'm putting in this flower, in this white flower is purple pollen, <laughs> purple flower pollen or vice versa. See, and it's giving me three purple and one white, what's going on? And he figured out mathematically the ratio, but it only appeared in the second generation. The first generation was all purple, meaning that purple is dominant but the recessive was snuck in there and didn't manifest until we got the heterozygote. Okay, so the seven characteristics he looked at, all or none, again, there are clusters of characteristics, the P, yellow or green. By the way, notice here a little uh, 
and just a curiosity, yellow P is the recessive. Uh, sorry, yellow is the dominant. When we buy the, the green giant uh, can of peas, they're all green, but that's the recessive trait. <laughs> it's just a curiosity. Yellow is the dominant, but the pod, the green is the dominant. The green pod and the yellow pod is the recessive. So it's flipped. Anyway, it's an individual characteristic. What I'm trying to say is that you can have a yellow pea with a green pod, or you can have a yellow pea with a yellow pod. <laughs> and vice versa, each characteristic is independent from each other. They're not related because they're not linked. These are not linked genes. These are genes that occur in different parts of the genome and they're not linked and they're not sex linked either, all right? So linking is a further sophistication or convolution of this whole thing. So Mendelian traits are all or none. Most of the traits are polymorphic, not Mendelian but these are a few Mendelians in the human that are polymorph, that are Mendelian, all right? So the hair on the back of our fingers. Some people have hair, some people don't have hair. It's between these two digits, okay? It's not the first digit. So we got three digits on the, or three segments on the finger, okay? The phalange, como era? Carpo, metacarpo, y the carps. The, yeah, proximal distal, uh-huh, okay, metacarpal inside, right, okay, so it's the middle, it's the middle phalange on the finger, the middle of the three sections, okay, either has hair or doesn't have hair, I used to have hair, now I lost it, <laughs> so that's a lot of not characteristic, uh, we, do, we think it doesn't have much evolutionary advantage. I don't think the spouses select each other by the hair in the middle of the fingers, okay? <laughs> but uh, that's one characteristic that is uh, kind of a schedule. Um, that is all or none. Rolling the tongue or not. I think most people can roll their tongue, but some don't. Again, I don't know if uh, humans select on that or not. I, I highly suspect they don't. Uh, the widow's peak, that little thing, on the front, that may be a selective advantage or disadvantage, I don't know, but most of us have straight hairline and if you have a little peak, and that's called the widow's peak, I don't know why widow, uh, the earlobe that we talked about, and then the finger thing, the thumb, to be able to disjoint it backwards like that, you know, some people that can do that, the hitchhiking thumb, push it back. <laughs> uh, less than 45 degrees is dominant, and more than 45 degrees recessive, okay? So most of us cannot do that. Uh, then there's something else about the distance of the index finger and the ring finger that you can read about here. But I wanted to point out the RH factor is more important on the blood because these things are kind of innocuous. No one lives or dies by these characteristics, but the RH factor could be uh, of impact when we need a transfusion or we wanna give a blood transfusion, okay? Aside from what is known as the ABO group, ABO, as in the letters A, B, and O, which the O actually stands for zero, those are proteins on the surface of the red blood cell. The red blood cell we call an RBC, and it's got proteins, it's got the A protein or the B protein. So people that only have A protein are A type blood. People that only have B protein, they're B, pro actually it's a carbohydrate, sorry. Uh, if they have the B carbohydrate, then they're B type. If they have both carbohydrates, A and B, then they're A, B type. If they have no A and no B carbohydrate, they're zero, they're O type because they're zero carbohydrates. That's with regards to the blood type, okay? Blood type, I'm, a, I'm actually O type. Most people are O type or, neur or universal donor because we can give blood, we cannot receive except from zero. That's the ABO group. In addition to that, we either positive or negative. People are less familiar with positive and negative. So that's called the RH factor. And the RH comes from the rhesus monkey. So here's the RH, okay? And it turns out that the rhesus monkey has this blood very similar to ours. And it's an Asian monkey, it's an old world monkey. We got the old world monkeys in Africa and Asia. And we got the new world monkeys in Latin America, all right? 
So the rhesus monkey was used for experimentation for many years still today in clinical trials because their blood type is very similar to ours and other characteristics that they have similar to the human. So it's one of those experimental animals that is used has to be ethically justified, of course, et cetera, et cetera. And this blood group was discovered in the rhesus monkey. This protein, we either have the protein or don't have the protein. If we have the protein, we're Rh positive. If we don't have the protein, we're Rh negative. What's the impact and the consequence? Let's say that we are Rh negative, all right? We don't have the protein. Now we receive a transfusion, but the nurse makes a mistake and gives us an Rh positive. It gives us the blood type, it gives me O type, so the type matches, but the Rh factor is wrong. If I as I'm, I'm O negative, I don't have the Rh protein. If I get O positive blood, what happens is that my immune system sees that protein as a foreign body and starts attacking it and clustering it and it will make blood clots and will kill me. So my immune reaction to the protein, to the RH positive protein will be so severe that it may kill me. And so that's why it's important, all right? So know, not only know your blood type, A, B, A, B, or O, but also know the group, positive or negative, all right? And that's called the RH factor. Typically factor is a reference to a protein. Okay, forward. And that's an all or none. So that's an all or none characteristic that does have an impact. <laughs> The others are innocuous. All right, so polymorphism is the standard. So how many faces of cats there are? As many cats as there are, <laughs> right? So that's polymorphic. They're all Felis domesticus. No, uh, no, Felis vulgaris. Uh, no, Canis vulgaris. Canis vulgaris. Felis domesticus is the species of the cat, right? Felis domesticus is the, the feline that was domesticated. And even that, I argue that the cat is not really domesticated at all. It's the owner of the cat that's domesticated. Rather, uh, for so faces of cats, they're all the same species. Right? Again, different breeds. So that's the argument. How about melanin on the human? Again, a very wide range, as you can see, from the least melanin to the most melanin, just as an example. They're all girls, they're all about the same age, more or less. And there's a range of melanin, right? So that's definitely polymorphism. How about the uh, fern trees that are in Australia, New Zealand? They're living fossils, they're actual trees. Look at the size of these ferns, okay? Uh, with an actual trunk and fronds, the leaves are called, the branches are called fronds. They're all the same species and look at the variation in size. Very obvious. I don't know if you ever had uh, aquariums at home. I had aquariums at home and raised guppies. These are the male guppies, same species. Each one of this is a different variant, okay? It's a variant of the same species. You like mushrooms? These are all uh, the portobello or their, uh, uh, What's the one, the other one that's edible? I think it's Portobello. These are all the same species of mushroom. Great variety. Hmm? Okay. So maybe this is what Darwin had noticed. And I told you about the supermarket thing or the not supermarket, just regular market in England and the uh, arrow tips in South America. Same fungus, different uh, chemicals, please. Yeah. What do you mean by phenotype? Exactly. Think about this phrase a little bit. What phenotype are we looking at here? Are we looking at sex? These are all girls. We're looking at age? Not necessarily. Size? Tallness? Not really. She's very tall. Most of them are about the same size. Well, what's the range distribution here? Melanin. So I'm looking at one phenotype. I'm discarding all the other phenotypes. We can also do a phenotype on, uh, on size, you know, or shape of the head or the distance between the two eyeballs. <laughs> but I'm looking at melanin. 
Yes, the trait, exactly, thank you. That's exactly, that's the trait, okay? So we can correlate more or less the traits to the 20,000 genes that we have, all right? If they express, then they're traits, okay? So there are five mm, observations that led Darwin to his theory of evolution. And these are, the, these are the five conclusions, if you will. The non-constancy of species. In other words, species is really a dynamic term. We see species today, here and now, when we look out the window and we start classifying all the individuals that we see living. But that's here and now, today, in this particular region. If we were to go with our mind's eye, it's the only way we can do this with our mind's eye and by the fossil record and so forth, we can go back in time to the lizards that we're seeing today, to the iguanas that we have in our forest that come from Latin America, from Central America. You know, and if we could go back in time with those iguanas, they are now one species, or actually I think four species, four different species of iguanas in Miami, but let's concentrate on the one species of iguana. If we will go back in time, we would see the ancestors of that iguana, right? And those ancestors would be slightly different. So they would be a different species, okay? So one species eventually evolves into another species. That's why he's talking about the non-constancy. The non-constancy of species really is an argument against spontaneous generation or spontaneous, uh, yeah, spontaneous generation. Okay, that the seagulls that we see today came from ancestral seagulls. And if we trace it back enough, the ancestral seagulls actually came from a reptile that didn't fly at all. But the four limbs, the forward limbs eventually adapted so that's what he means by the non-constancy of species. It's, it's an argument, it's kind of a roundabout argument against the spontaneous generation thing. The static of spontaneous generation. Okay, the scent of all from common ancestors, so one kind of follows the other one. If species are non-constant and we see today species are similar, lions and tigers and cats and pumas and panthers, and lynxes and bobcats and uh, what did I leave out? Cheetahs, they all look rather similar. They're all felines, they're top felines, they're hunters. Uh, so we can deduce that they have a common ancestor, that there was a primitive. And lo and behold, we see the fossils of a saber toothed tiger that has the pattern, the, the stripes of a tiger, but the size of a lion and perhaps even a mange, which tigers don't have much, but the saber tooth may have had a little mange, which belongs to the lion. And none of which have the tooth, the claw, the, 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 the canine that, uh, that that feline had. All right, so the non-constancy uh, is pointing toward a common ancestor. The gradualness is that this is occurring over time, geologic time. You know what we mean by paucity of record is just uh, scarcity. You can substitute paucity for scarcity. It's just a fancy word. Most animals and plants, uh, not to mention fungi when dead, decay, do not fossilize. The vast majority of organisms that die, they decay. The bacteria, first they get in and metabolize, so there goes the fossil for that one, right? Otherwise, they just rot, and so we have no fossils. So that's the scarcity of the fossil record. From that scarcity, we have enough evidence to put the tree together, but there are gaps. The gaps is not because they never existed, it's because we haven't found them or they just aren't around anymore. 
There's also a branching effect. What we see here today is biodiversity. We don't see a single feline. We see a multiplicity of felines, depending if we are in South America, North America, Africa, Asia, or Europe, each one of those major continents has felines. And by the way, Antarctica, I'm sorry, well, Antarctica has no felines for, for sure, <laughs> uh, other than the ones that may have been taken there by humans, but um, Australia and New Zealand don't have felines originally. They have marsupials, okay? And so we see, but the, the other continents have felines in a diversity. So biodiversity is a standard. That means that there's a branching out, just like ethnicities. You can see a parallel with languages. You know, we have a greater and greater diversity of languages going on. So languages become slang and slang again eventually become new languages, right? Or uh, dialects. So the tendency is towards spreading, branching. And the force that actually affects evolution is what uh, Darwin called natural selection, which is borrowing a term from artificial selection. In other words, artificial selection was already known not just for centuries, for millennia before Darwin. They say that it was a royal mess. It was embarrassing to go to, to, go to a restaurant with Darwin. Because what Darwin would do, instead of eating his food, he would start playing with it and see what came from where. And so if you gave him cauliflower and broccoli and kale and cabbage, he would say, oh, all these come from an original plant, which is a wild mustard. And this part of the plant became the cauliflower and this other part of the plant became the kale and this other part of the plant became the broccoli. <laughs> by artificial selection, because we select artificially, the human selects on purpose on the biggest apple of all the apples. And we take those seeds of the biggest apple and plant those seeds. And when they grow, we select the biggest of that generation and grow that apple. And so we're selecting on size of the apple. Or we can select, have you seen the strawberries? Have you been to the supermarket lately? The strawberries beginning to look like the size of an apple. <laughs> and wild strawberries, are the size of a uh, blueberry <laughs> or smaller. Those are wild strawberries and they're very fibrous and they have more seeds than strawberry, <laughs> you know? And so you see, we select the crab apple, which is the original apple, is, a, is the size of a cherry, all right? And now the Macintosh is almost the size of a human head. So we're, that's artificial selection which has been going on for millennia. The Egyptians had it, the Chinese seas, dynasties, the Hindus, the Mesopotamia had it, you know, the Aztecs, all these primitive cultures, not primitive, but ancient cultures, they all had artificial selection little by little. That's how we get the dog from the wolf. And so Darwin is saying, well, that's selection on purpose. Nature is doing the same thing, but without purpose, mindless. And so the alternative is by chance. If it's not by purpose, it's by chance. Where's the chance? Well, that's where Darwin became dumb and didn't see Mendel's mechanism, which is the inheritance factor. Guess what? If we mutate the inheritance factor, we're already introducing variation on the next generation. By mutating the inheritance factor, today we call them genes. And so mutation, the chance random mutation is the one that is driving uh, evolution. Getting ahead of myself, let me give an example of each one of these five uh, items non-constancy of species, right? Here is the evolution of the elephant, the African elephant specifically is the one that's shown here. They could have shown the Indian elephant either way. But before that, we have fossil record. In fact, we actually have tissue, soft tissue of the mammoth, right? The mammothus. Up in Siberia, they've uh, thawed some of these out. They try to clone it into an elephant egg to see if they can resuscitate a mammoth <laughs> from the DNA by doing cloning. Uh, but we have even soft tissue of the mammoth that looks somewhat like the elephant, not out exactly, different species, same. I don't know if it's a level of genome. No, it's not the level of genome. So it has to be at the level of family, all right? At the level of family. And there's an ancestor to that guy. This is more and more from the fossil record. 
and an ancestor to the Trilophodon. There's an ancestor to that. Go back about 35 million years ago, the original ancestor, the common ancestor of all the elephantoids. Okay. Here's the actual, this is the uh, skull structure of the Moeritherium. The Moeritherium had nothing close to the tusks that the elephant has today, or even the mammal. He had just little tiny uh, carnivore teeth there that eventually continued to grow, all right? And the snout also. So there's a selection process going in here on the canine and on the snout. There's a preference probably on the female because these are mammals. The female is selecting for larger uh, trunk or snout and larger canines. Happens also, you know, when the chimpanzee laugh, they go <laughs> and they laugh. See, I've been practicing a lot. <laughs> well, actually they're showing, we see it as laughter, but what they're doing is they're showing the canines. So the alpha male is laughing to the beta male, telling, hey, hey stay away because I'm going to put one of these into you. <laughs> so we call it laugh, but they're actually showing their canines. It's anything but laughter, it's aggression behavior, aggressive behavior. And so deterrence works for every other species except the human. We actually have to get into the conflict. All right, so uh, the second one, so, Again, the non-constancy, right? You see there's a gradual progression here from the Moeritherium, Moeritherium to the elephant of today. There's been a gradual okay. progression. So they are not the same species now? Absolutely not. You can see the actual name. A mammoth is not an elephant, similar to an elephant, but when have you seen an actual elephant, either African or Indian with this kind of tusks? They don't exist, not that far, okay? and in combination with the teeth. So the mammoth is a different species and a different genus. It's not, the elephants is not mammoth, it's elephants, okay? It's probably elephants africanus and African indianis, whatever it is, the two species of elephants that we have today. And the mammoth is not the trilophodon. The trilophodon is ancestor to mammoth. Mammoth is ancestor to elephant. But there's a progression, particularly here, they're focusing on two traits or two phenotypes. And, and so two. we can consider them as a, a, a variant in for, for the evolution in the population? Well, not quite, because the variant would be among species, within species. So we got variant elephants. We got variant mammoths. In other words, elephants, African elephants with different size tusks, right? African elephants with different size tusk, with different size snout or trunk, with different size ears, those are variants on the elephant. But in between species, there's obvious variants. But we're talking about within species. In other words, natural selection is going to act on the variant within the species. So it's going to be a variant of the mammoths. Some mammoths have bigger trunks than others. Some mammals have bigger ears than others, but still mammals. So the variant is within the species. It's, it, it's a rigor of thinking, all right? It's a rigor of thinking in particular categories. All right? So uh, here, by the way, is a tusk, is a skeleton of a trilophodon. You see the tusk facing downward, this actually existed at some point, there's a skeleton. 25 million, it's been dated to 25 million years ago. Okay, and at some point, the, the teeth turned upward, <laughs> all right? And so this is the actual fossil record right there. 35 million, 25 million, in 10 million years, look what happened to the tusks. <laughs> they went berserk. Which, by the way, it's not the canines. I was wrong. The canines are further back. These are actually the incisors. The incisors are the two front teeth, which we still use for clipping, like rodents, but these guys use for something else. <laughs> I don't know, scraping or whatever. Okay. But those are the incisors, the two front teeth. You can see it from here because the skull is very clear. 
All right, so the non-constancy, need to move a little more rapidly here. The branching effect, you can see it, the three main domains, right? The gradualness, this is known as the El Hippos. The El Hippos occurred about 50 million years ago and we have fossil record of it. Quite a few fossils from, from the El Hippos. The forefoot had the four digits hitting the ground. The, the feet had the four digits and the skull. And in 50 million years, El Hippos underwent evolutionary pressure to Mesohippos, to Mary Hippos, and to eventually Equus. This is at the level of genus, right? Equus is the genus. From three million years ago, we have basically the modern horse. Look what happened to the central digit, to the middle finger, the middle finger, I don't wanna pull it out by itself, okay? But the middle finger kept impinging Maybe, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud here that the selective pressure may have been to run faster. So there's less friction on, on a single finger, running on a single finger as opposed to running on the whole hand. Okay, so that the single digit, the middle finger is the one that was selected, felt the pressure to be bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that today what the, what the horse has is actually running on the middle finger in fact, on the claw, on the, on the hoof, on the nail of the middle finger, what we call the hoof. And the other three fingers are on the side. Actually, other, the other three fingers are degenerate or vestigial on the side of the leg, all right? So the dog, the, the horse is running on the middle finger, on the fingernail of the middle finger. And Somehow that allows for faster running, getting away from the lion. <laughs> so there was selective pressure in that favor. Maybe it's a way of running faster through the savanna or something like that, I don't know. But the original El Hippos 50 million years ago was the size of a dog more or less, kind of a small dog, right? And running on all fingers. Okay, so that's the gradualness. See it there with regards to the leg and the size. The skull basically grew in size. The other one, the multiplication, as we have that gradualness, we also have the radiation and there's a multiplication. So again, all these nodes that are signal here are breaking points of our common ancestry. This is just tracing the dinosaur. Okay, from its original uh, Saurus, which is just a reference for reptile, and all the branching that has occurred from one single primitive small lizard like dinosaur, Saur, Saurus, to the branching effect. Some became voracious carnivores, others became herbivores and increased human among size, some became very rapid for running just on the hind legs, on the back legs, on the rear legs. Others kept all fours on, on the ground. So tremendous variety and diversity of only the dinosaurs from the fossil record, from a single primitive Saurus way back, okay? The Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, these are geologic eras that are separated by millions of years. So there's a tendency, gradual, but definite tendency toward biodiversity, toward branching. It's what we call adaptive radiation. Here's another example with the mammals. These are the mammals. There's a rabbit. Uh, this is uh, primates, okay. Monkeys, we're in here somewhere biologically. Uh, bats, carnivores. Pointing to the wrong animal underneath, <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera. The 
These guys look like the ruminants, uh, cattle. Uh, um, cetaceans, cetaceans are whales, dolphins, dugongs, uh, all the marine mammals, right? Uh, including the manatee. Here we go. Notice that the tail is horizontal, instead of vertical. Blue fish have vertical tails. Uh, marine mammals have horizontal tails, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all the mammals from a single common ancestor, their gaps, the fossil record, because we haven't found them or because they are no more. Okay, yes, sigh of relief. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Uh, I've expanded all over the place a little bit, but we still have a second little lecture to do in half an hour or 20 minutes of the four forces of evolution. So any pressing comments or questions? I hear none, so I'm gonna um, pause recording, take a break, five minutes, please. Five minutes will be brief soon. All right, welcome back. And uh, this second half uh, presentation is on a, it's in a PDF format. Don't worry about it. It's the same thing. I'll send it out uh, the same. Um, so I think I sent it. I sent uh, both presentations, no? Uh, I just call them A and B. Did you all get this one? Yeah. Uh, yes. Included in the email, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So. The four main forces of evolution, basically mutation, migration, drift, and selection. Now keep in mind that Darwin is still looking at phenotype, all right? He's looking at phenotype and he's making these conclusions from uh, uh, the phenotype. So now I can talk with, uh, you understand that it's only because he didn't have access to the genotype. Had he not discarded the math, <laughs> he would have had access to the genotype somehow, right? And he could have had the full glory and probably he would have gone in ecstasies, uh, realizing, imagine that he had the mechanism, the, the mechanism for his theory of evolution. Instead, he gets smeared and slanted and all that, uh, what happened to him? So these are the forces now that we see are influencing uh, evolution, the process of evolution. Let me see if this is a little, okay. We're back to this diagram a little bit. So I'm looking at, sorry, let me back out. Mutation, migration, drift, and selection, okay? So we're gonna go through each one of these for some level of detail. Here's mutations, which also includes in the general term, recombination, DNA recombination, and transposons. These are things, mechanisms that happen to uh, the DNA in our cells. <coughs> Specifically, the cells that we're concerned with here with regards to evolution are the gametes, the gametes, the sex cells, because that's what's being passed on from one generation to the next, okay? So generally speaking, egg and sperm, not just in the human, but if every animal and every plant, remember I told you the equivalent of sperm in plants is the pollen grains, which in fact, each pollen grain has two sperm cells within, all right? So any organism, plant or animal that reproduces sexually, they have to go through the process of fertilization. That's what it means, that's what sexual reproduction means. And so the gametes, the egg and the sperm, that's the DNA that we're concerned with because that's the DNA that will generate the next generation. So these mutations uh, may occur in every cell of our body. And if I get skin cancer, who cares? Well, I care, but my progeny don't care because the skin cancer is not going to affect if as long as it stays a skin cancer and not testicular cancer, then it only affects me, but not the future generation, all right? So this is important, uh, the, the mutation aspect is important in the sex cells, in the gametes or the reproductive organs that are producing those cells. So let's look at these. The level of the DNA molecule, sexual reproduction, at the precursor of the gametes, 
and the, the making gametes, producing sex cells, is a process called meiosis. I think, did we cover meios mitosis and meiosis yet? No? Okay, we'll get to it in greater detail. But uh, there is also mm, there is also mutations that occur in asexual, in non-sexual reproduction, all right? In asexual reproduction, in what we call lateral gene transfer and in clones. There's less mutation, but mutations can also occur in asexual reproduction. This means that mutations can occur in sexual reproduction and in asexual reproduction, therefore mutations can occur all over the place in every mode of reproduction, because those are the two modes of reproduction, either sexual or non-sexual. An example of non-sexual, of asexual reproduction, bacteria. It's a simple example, okay? But also other animals and plants by vegetative propagation, like grafting. Okay, so let's go back to sexual reproduction. The union of egg and sperm, these are actually micrographs, in other words, microscopic photographs. So that's the real size of egg and sperm. And in mammals in general, humans, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the eggs producing ovaries, testicles, uh, sperm producing testicles. So these organs are the delicate organs. If they get ultraviolet radiation or excessive heat, they can mutate. And then the cells, will carry defective DNA. So that's the danger there. So sperm are produced within these vesicles here, we call the epididymis, all right? Or the seminiferous tubules. And they all eventually gather into the vas deferens. It's like a storage of the uh, semen of the, of the sperm. And in the ovaries, of course, the follicles mature until the follicle functionally ruptures and releases here a mature egg. So that's what we call gametogenesis. Genesis is origin or production of. So gametogenesis is the production of gametes. Gametes are sex cells, sperm for male, egg for female. So just basic terminology is a review of elementary. All right. Uh, the other one in asexual reproduction, I mentioned non-sexual reproduction, lateral gene transfer or clones. Here's an example of lateral gene transfer between bacteria. Bacteria have this little tube, one pilus, several pili. It's like a little tube that sticks out, okay? It's a little tube. Sometimes these tubes connect to bacteria and then a piece of DNA or RNA is pushed through the tube into the other bacterium. Okay. Plasmids are just circular DNA in bacteria. It's a little circular DNA. So that can be pushed into another bacterium. And now the new, the, the other bacterium has a duplicate of that plasmid. So as a type of, known as lateral transfer. <clears throat> this plasmid can mutate with radiation or high heat, and that mutation will be passed on. Also toxic chemicals can cause mutation. Mutagens are called mutagens, can cause um, mutation like DDT was causing mutation in bird producing the, the egg shell, all right? Another example different from lateral transfer is called vegetative propagation. For example, little tufts of grass, the grass will put out a shoot that shoot will, will embed into the ground and produce a new uh, spike of grass, all right? So these are all clones of the original spike of grass, the original individual. These are separate individuals, but they're clones. They have the same DNA. Budding off occurs in amoebas and a um, number of what we call lower animals or more primitive animals. Splitting in half, again, we don't want people understanding what we're talking about. So instead of saying splitting in half, we say binary fission. Fission is a reference to split. Fusion is a reference to uniting. 
All right? So nuclear fusion, nuclear fission. And binary fission is just a fancy word for splitting in two, from one, two. Also, this occurs in mitosis. It's occurring in our cells all the time, in our bodies. Mitosis, which is cell division. No, separate. These are separate examples. We got vegetative propagation. We got budding off. We got binary fission. We got fragmentation and regeneration. These are separate examples of asexual reproduction. Separate examples. We take a starfish. We pull off an arm, we yank off an arm. Not only will the starfish grow a new arm, typically a little shorter, but also the arm will grow a new starfish, depending if it contains part of what is known as a central disc. Central disc is a central part of the starfish. Okay, if it contains part of that central disc, that arm will grow a new starfish. So these are clones. Actually, this is two different species, you know, so just for purpose of illustration. But this, with one individual, we can get two individuals that are identical to each other from asexual reproduction. So these are all variants of clones, different varieties of clones, just the mechanism. But the DNA is the same, right? All right, let's go forward. So these are just examples of mutation at the molecular level. It can be the change. Each one of these letters codes for what we call a nucleotide or a base, a base, B-A-S-E, or a nucleotide. The base pairs are the ones that form the rungs or the steps of the ladder, right? And they're just put in single words. Three base pairs together, consecutive, three base together code for a particular amino acid. Remember the, Ure Miller experiment, there were 20 amino acids in nature and they're listed by little letters. So the triplet code, right? That's the genetic code, the triplet. Uh, CCU, for example, codes for proline. And this one is tryptophan and this one is tyrosine and this is glucosamine, arginine, phenylalanine, right? These are all amino acids. Too much detail for now, I just wanna say that Sometimes if we change a single base or a single nucleotide, it will make a, we can do a substitution for a different base, or we can do a shame, uh, uh, frame shift. If a base is taken out, the frame is shifted. It's called frame shift, point deletion. And most point deletions are uh, Nonsense are, are no point deletions are neutral. They don't cause any effect because they occur on the 97% of the DNA that is non coding. But if it occurs in a coding region, it will, uh, it will shift all of the frame downstream and it will make nonsense out of the triplet code. And so that protein is going to be truncated, that protein is going to be defective. So depending on where it occurs, a point deletion, a single base deletion could cause a mutation that is harmful, all right? Rarely, it could actually cause a mutation that is beneficial. Most of the time, the mutations are neutral because they occur on the 97% of the genome that is non-coding. So they're not affecting anything. They're going, it's nonsense upon nonsense. But so you see that mutations can, of a single, um, base can may have an effect. In this case, one substitution causes what is known as beta thalassemia, which is a disease, the effective protein for a change in a single base because it truncates the protein. It actually makes a stop codon, which stops the protein short. Other examples of uh, mutations, sometimes uh, an entire segment is either inverted or is translocated to a different region or is duplicated or is inverted. Sometimes we get what is known as palindromes. Palindromes is A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. Palindromes, that is a C, the same sequence, but in reverse. Okay, so all these are possibilities of mutations in the chromosome either single mutations 
of a single base or entire sequences. Of course, if this occurs in coding region, if this occurs in, G, in, uh, in genes, then it may have an effect, right? Because it's gonna make for a defective protein. Causes of mutation. The three main causes of mutation are UV, chemicals, and heat. All right. So ultraviolet radiation, there are three types of ultraviolet radiation, A, B, and C. C is uh, typically doesn't penetrate the atmosphere. UVB penetrates some of the atmosphere, but gets mostly uh, blocked out by cloud cover. Uh, UVA goes right through the cloud cover. That's why even when it's cloudy outside, we should use a sun block because UVA is the most powerful one, so powerful that it goes through clouds and hits the surface of our skin and can cause uh, skin cancer and other cancers. So uh, that's one type of, uh, these are all called uh, mutagens or carcinogens or teratogens is another word that you see around here, teratogen, okay. Ultraviolet radiation. Chemicals, hard chemicals, harsh chemicals. This one, for example, acridine looks very similar and fits inside the DNA molecule. Can introduce, can insert, and can cause a breakage or alter the sequence. So again, these are carcinogens or teratogens. They cause mutations, harsh chemicals. Again, DDT was one until it was banned used in many countries of the world till today to control mosquitoes, DDT, <laughs> unfortunately. And heat, high heat can also uh, loosen these bonds, break bonds and reestablish bonds. Um, uh, and so a high heat can also cause mutations, right? High heat could be a source of, well, I'm gonna hold off on that comment, it's gonna give me another tangent. All right, uh, recombination is a different type of uh, mutation, if you will. It's not exactly mutation, but it's a transposition of segments of chromosome on the legs. The legs on the chromosomes are called the, the P and the Q legs. Don't worry about it for now. But the, these legs are held together by a central region called a centromere. We'll look at it in more detail, but during the, the distribution of chromosomes into the gametes, during gametogenesis, there's a process that is known as recombination or crossing over, all right? And this recombination is that these pairs, so you see here's a pair of chromosomes, right? Let's say it's pair one, they look like nice and big. So this is pair one. This is one A and this is one B. They have already replicated, they have already duplicated because each one has four legs, all right? But before they separate to go to the opposite poles of the cell, they exchange, they may exchange parts of the legs, exchange parts of the legs. Now these are homologous chromosomes. These are chromosomes that are of the same pair. This is pair one, you see they have the same size or it could be pair two or it could be pair 15, but it's a pair. It's a pair, so they're homologous. That's why it's called homologous. They have the same genes. However, of the same gene, some can be dominant, the other one can be recessive. So it's the color, for example, the color of the P. It's the color of the P, but one color is green, the other color is yellow. Ear lobe. It's the ear lobe, but one gene is attached ear lobe, the other one is detached ear lobe. Because attached is dominant, if I get a detached ear lobe from my mom, but an attached ear lobe gene from my dad, my ear lobes should be attached because the attach is dominant. But the recessive is there. So my children may be able to get the detached ear lobe if I mate with another person that also has that detached gene, you see? So this uh, crossing over of genes of the same category but variants, this is variation at the molecular level. This is variation at the genetic level, at the gene level. 
So variants can get crossed over and flipped. Those variants, those are called recombinant genes. The, guy, the ones that get swapped and switched, those are called recombinant genes or recombinant chromatids. And the non-recombinant chromatids are the ones that didn't swap legs, <laughs> okay? Didn't exchange part of the legs. So if recombination goes on, you see that we have a variety of gametes. All these four gametes came from the same precursor cell, whether it's egg or sperm. But you can see that for this one leg, the four gametes, we actually have four variants. One fully dominant, one fully recessive, and the others half and half, okay, recombinants. So it depends on which one of these four sperm fertilizes the egg, which one of these four variants gets passed on. And the other three don't get passed on because the other three sperm did not fertilize the egg. In the same ejaculation, in the same gametogenesis, in the same pool of sperm coming from the same precursor cell because it's one single ejaculation with millions of sperm. Okay, so variants at the genetic level. So this technically in the, in the big picture can be seen as a type of mutation in the sense that it causes variation, all right? And it's at the genetic level. Okay, moving forward. So this is one of Mendel's two laws of, um, uh, he has two laws of genetics, independent assortment, is that each gene, each, sorry, each chromosome will assort, will move to the daughter cells independently. Each chromosome will move independently of each other and that's how we can get recombinant. These are the two possibilities, either possibility A or possibility B, depending on how the chromosome pairs line up at the equator of the cell when the cell is reproducing. Keep in mind that this is only for cells that are reproducing. We're talking about producing gametes, right? So the precursor cells have to reproduce to make the gametes, to produce the gametes. If you're not clear on the fine tuning details, don't worry about it because we'll revisit this when we look at the beginning of life um, course, all right? In greater detail, more paused. Mm. Okay, there's a little video here explaining transposons. It's only two to three minutes, but I'm not gonna play it. It's in the, it's embedded in the presentation. So you can look at it at your leisure. It explains transposons. This actually, as bizarre as it sounds, genes can jump from one region of the chromosome to another, or from one chromosome to another in the chromatin level. At the chromatin level, genes can jump from one place to another. It's a very sophisticated mechanism. No one has understood it very well yet. It's a lot of uh, investigation going into that region, into that type of genetics, which is transposons, but this occurs. Genes uh, jump around. So it's, again, the DNA molecule is not static. It's stable, but not static, meaning that the genes themselves can switch around and, and flip-flop, all right? And some of the cousins, one time the cousins are in this household, the other time the cousins are in a different household. That happens. It's a dynamic system that is highly sophisticated and we're just barely scratching the surface of these mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Most mutations are neutral. They don't affect because they fall in the non-coding region. Some are harmful and a few are actually beneficial. The beneficial, is the one that has the possibility for selection, for natural selection, the beneficial uh, mutations. Viruses, well, discovers the two cycles of the virus, the lytic and the lysogenic. Mm. And for the sake of uh, time, I'm gonna skip viruses. I'll come back to it uh, later. Let me see what we have here. Yeah, because we still have the other three let me give an overview of the other three. So we have mutation, too much detail about mutation, uh, but it's the beginning of the possibility of evolution. 
is mutation because it's the beginning of the possibility of variation, of variance. Migration. Migration is a gene flow. In other words, think of an individual organism as a bag of genes, all right? Think of these zebras as bags of zebra genome. And each individual is carrying a variant of that bag of genomes. They're all zebra genomes. They belong to the same species, but there's variation between them. For example, look at the variation and the pattern of stripes. Which one of the, uh, it's at the at, at the first blush, this is morphological variation, right? Look at the, the variation of pattern. Look at the variation here. Look at the V, how deep it goes on this zebra. You see my pointer, the top zebra, the V goes fairly deep. The V here is shallow, it's mostly up, up on the back of the zebra. Look at this pattern, it's got thin stripes in between the thick stripes, different pattern altogether. So when we look at these zebras in detail, we see a variety of patterns. Look at the rump on this one and the rump on this one, all right? So each one of these zebras is a bag, is a zebra genome bag, specifically in their sex cells. They're all zebra, same species, but variants. And that variant is kind of concentrated in the sex cells. So when these zebras move geographically from one region to another, which zebra mates with which? That's at the deterministic level. You know, that this zebra made it with this zebra. So those two variants are the variants that are passed on. And the zebras that didn't get to mate, their variation may not get passed on. So you see that migration, we call it gene flow when we concentrate on the gametes, occurs and it's occurring all the time because it's migration, immigration and emigration, right? Into a region, out of a region, not only in animals, but also in plants. We can see at first sight on this, uh, on this dunes by the beach, right? It's just outside our windows here in Miami Beach. Uh, no, not quite, but it's a few miles away. <laughs> We see at least two different species of plants very clearly. There's this creeper plant, right? That is reaching out into the sand, literally. It's a creeper uh, plant. And then there is this grass with the tufts. They're, they're definitely two different species. These grasses, by the way, have very, very deep roots and they're trying to scrounge up some whatever little humidity they can find down there. But these are pioneers, okay? I can see how the uh, the, the tendrils of the creeper is reaching out to new areas to colonize barren areas of sand. So there's colonization going on here. The same with the other one. Uh, I cannot open it, it's a PDF. But the same with the grassy uh, plant, it puts out little tufts like the vegetative propagation and they're colonizing and otherwise barren area of sand, all right? So these genomes are moving into that area. You think of the plant, their sperm, their, their pollen, and their, even the vegetative propagation that is occurring, they're colonizing an area that was barren before. So there is migration, there's immigration, gene flow. All right, so that's the second type. Uh, the third one, um, oh, so, with regards to this range, size range. Okay, so these are the sloth, right? This happens to be a three-toed sloth. There are two-toed sloth and three-toed sloth, and they're mostly in South America, and they move very slowly. So slowly that they don't move more than maybe a mile from the tree where they were born uh, the whole lifetime. And sometimes they don't even move out of the tree where they were born for the whole lifetime, or maybe two trees. I remember seeing one of these crossing the roads when I was visiting in Panama one time. It takes about two hours to cross the road because they go very, very slowly. And the Indians, uh, the natives sell them on the side of the road, <laughs> these baby ones, it's a whole other story. Anyway, uh, sloths are very slow and the range is very limited because they're slow, whereas, Conifers and the seed dispersal of conifers, maybe miles and miles and miles, entire hectares, okay, entire acreage of the same species, because they have a wide range of distribution, mostly by the 
blowing of the air, um, the seed, the things, the seeds, uh, wind dispersal. So the range varies widely from population to population, from species to species, but there is migration, all right? It's also dynamic in the sense that the, some of the plants may be at the core of, of the distribution and some may be at the border of the distribution. For example, in the center here is mostly the, um, just the lilies, the, the daisies in the middle, but here at the edge, we have other uh, flowers and plants, and there's a boundary, there's an intermix here, all right? Uh, this is bacteria uh, treated by uh, the penic uh, penicillin producing bacteria, for example, and how there's also uh, a range, whether it's the core or the edge, it's the edge of the bacteria, uh, if it's the edge that is colonizing a new area, then the bacteria, the genome at the center is not going to migrate, but it's only the one, the variants that are at the edge that are going to migrate. Okay. So uh, population uh, migration can be very tiny microscopic or can be macroscopic. Uh, it depends on the species great variety there, but migration occurring. Also, well, we'll see this in greater detail when we get into uh, the environmental course, the stages of succession from colonizing all the way to an established forest. Third one, drift. Drift is where randomness comes in again. So randomness comes in really at all these levels because the migration, the animals, migrate more or less uh, following each other. Plants also migrate. There's a certain statistical stochastic uh, process there. Stochastic meaning that it's random, okay? But you can see that these fish are, there are different populations of fish here, right? Because we have several different species. There are these tanks, the blue tanks, and there are these wrasses, the, uh, uh, yellow ones and red ones and so forth, and different types of uh, species. But within the same species, within the same species, there's variation. Some have darker, lighter faces and so forth. So mating may make a difference for these. Depends on the male and the female who mate, or actually these lay eggs actually at the bottom of the ocean, uh, on the floor. Uh, but there is, a, it's a genetic drift is by random. And there's one effect that is called the bottleneck effect. It's illustrated here. If I have a bottle full of marbles and the marbles are of two colors. The colors are yellow and blue, okay? They're distributed randomly inside the bottle. They're distributed randomly. If I pour out only a few marbles, just out of randomness. It may be that I get more blue marbles or more yellow marbles. It's random, okay? But then if these marbles reproduce, I end up with either more blue marbles or more yellow marbles, depending on the pioneer population that went through the bottleneck. And so that will skew the population going forward for the next generations. That's called a bottleneck effect. And again, it's part of uh, genetic drift. The same here with beetles. Here, there were three green beetles and six brown beetles. But this guy was walking around totally careless, didn't realize the beetles, or maybe he crunched them on purpose, but he happened to crunch only on the green beetles. So now after the crunching effect, now we only got one green beetle and we still have the six brown beetles. By the way, beetles reproduce sexually. And so this one beetle is on the way to extinction because there's no, <laughs> doesn't matter if it was male or female, the other sex is no longer available. <laughs> Okay, 
So this is a, a catastrophic event for the green beetle. All right. But you see it's by random, maybe, I don't know, maybe he did it on purpose, maybe not, but for the beetle, they were at the wrong place at the wrong time, the green ones. So that's drift. It can also happen as the cows chew on the grass inside the fence, but outside the fence, the grass is okay, didn't get chewed by the cattle, <laughs> all right? So there was selective pressure inside the fence. A lightning, there's nothing more random we consider than the striking of lightning. Actually, there is not random at all. There are electrical forces that are at work, static forces that are at work there. But for the purpose of biology, this may have been the most robust tree there, the most feed tree, tree, the tallest, most robust tree. So it is the fittest, right? Biologically speaking, but it happened to get hit by lightning, so the fittest got selected out. Just like the alpha gorilla happened to be walking underneath the falling tree on his way to mating and got hit by the tree, so they'd mate, and that was the alpha male. So it got hit by the tree, you know, uh, by chance. So what I'm saying is that chance is also in the evolutionary process, okay? That's the randomness. So it's not directed. Not directed, not in that sense. We can make a case as believers that is directed in the bigger picture of who established the laws of evolution, who established randomness, who established the laws of randomness, that, they, that randomness is random. <laughs> okay, that's where we can make the argument of God, but not directly, very indirectly. So these are the four, and of the four, Selection is really the one that causes the evolution to occur, the actual mechanism. And so it's going to have an electron its own. I don't know if it's exactly the next one. I think it's due down. But anyway, uh, uh, selection itself will have a whole lecture for itself. Okay, so we'll cover that then. So I apologize. I went a little over. I'm also starting a little late, but it's just that I diverse too much. Mm, that should be the last one. Yeah. All right, questions, comments, nothing. Focus online, we're very good, don't leave yet. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop the recording itself, but don't leave. I, I, I just wanna say that this is fascinating, fascinating. I, I, I never yeah. thought I was gonna like it so much, but it's fascinating. I, I, there's probably a lot of confusion in my mind and to get it all, but. I, I love it. It's incredible. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Christina, that probably you have the, the least of the scientific backgrounds here, but uh, I mean, we go back for decades since Epiphany uh, Parish, right? But uh, you're, as a side, you're also kind of getting a bachelor's in biology <laughs> to fit in here a little bit. But uh, hang in there. Again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me, all right? But uh, I just tend to cover too much detail. Um, I want to stop the recording now and stay online. So let me do that.